This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is the number one mentoring program that teaches you e-commerce from scratch. Change has a real community with real results. I have been working with Ryan for many years now and have attended many of his events and retreats across the world and got to meet members and the amazing community of like-minded people. Ryan works with a lot of big names in the business world, helping them build online businesses and e-commerce. Change offers personal one-on-one support, no experience needed, but like anything, this takes time and is not a get-rich-quick scheme. If you put the work in, you will get the results. E-commerce and online shopping is getting bigger and bigger. This is a great opportunity for anyone that is looking for financial freedom. For more information, go follow Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help you get started and build a successful online business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. <laughs> and today's guest we've got Liam Tuff. Tuff, say boy, how are we? I'm good, brother. Good to see you. Old times. Yeah, 18 months mm. since your first podcast. You've came a long way. You've now started your own podcast. It's um, doing well, really well. Nearly 100,000 followers, subscribers. So anybody who's watched you or hasn't watched you, jump over and subscribe. Some great guests, some great stories. But again, it's good to have you on. Not just in this 18 months we've done the podcast, but we've also grew a friendship, a bond, and we've stayed close, which is important, especially in this day and age, brother. But how are you? I'm good, mate. I'm glad that we're here under different circumstances from the first one, which was very dark, very heavy. It opened it opened Pandora's box, but it's a ne- it was a necessary box to open just to send a, a message out there to people watching that if you have been through a similar thing or you're going through a similar thing, if someone like me can come out shamelessly and actually with a sense of pride and say, hey, this is wrong, this happened to me, I want to speak about it. If I can pass that baton of strength to somebody, I will do. I feel like men in this world, if they're going to make it in life to the end, You've got to have a purpose. And I know that that's a cliche. And if you go on Instagram, you're going to see every motivational speaker talking about your morning routine and a purpose. And, you know, but it's it's fundamentally true. You've got to have a purpose. And I've I've always thought my purpose is to support other people in need, pass the baton of strength onto people that are just maybe lacking something, which is normally self-confidence. We had this conversation last night when we was flicking through, I think it was TikTok, and there's two guys in the van, and they're rapping, Mm -hmm. uh, sort of freestyling to to the background music. And you said there's people out there that are so talented, but they're just lacking the self-belief. So, yeah, I feel feel like my purpose is to, A, be a phenomenal friend, and I'm sure we'll touch base on how we need to stick together now because of the division in the country and just sort of the world over how the importance of sticking together, being loyal, being, being men amongst men. And so if I can see greatness in someone, particularly a friend that's down on his luck, because we all do that. We're not always on top of the world. Mm-hmm. And if you can catch somebody when they're falling before they hit rock bottom and just remind them, you're really good at doing that. You look great in that. I like the way you think about this. Your perspective is really inspiring there. Just remind them as they're starting to feel invisible. Because I thought that that's where we're at now. I'm going off on a fucking rant already. Well, I'm, it's not so much a rant. It's just my purpose to be on the internet is, is to deliver a message of hope and strength and will to people that are sort of being blown around in the wind like a leaf. Because since doing the podcast, 
I suppose we'll go down that route, seeing as you mentioned that at the start. And it's important also that people, your subscribers, because you've got a great following, they're very loyal. And I think it's nice for them to hear what you're all about behind the camera, behind the scenes, because you're also a very supportive, loyal, good man. We formed a good friendship over the last 80 months. I mean, a very good friendship. I've been up to stay with you in Glasgow. We're now out here in Spain. And the older I get, the less people I trust, the less people I like, because the world's changing, people's frame of mind is changing. Everyone's becoming slowly but surely indoctrinated, whether they realize it or not. And people are, they're not just competing with, with others. They're kind of resentful of others if they're doing well, or certainly if they're doing better than them. I've noticed a lot of people there, they're very happy if you're doing well, just as long as you're behind them. So just to give you a nod to your subscribers, like I can vouch behind the scenes, you're a very, very supportive, kind individual and a good friend. And I'm very happy to be here. And going back to the podcast journey and my purpose is I see a lot of sadness in people's eyes when they come on and talk to me and tell me their stories. And like, again, like I said, again, I feel my purpose is just to, just to see something good in them. Because we get some fucking terrible people come on our shows, mate. <laughs> or let me, let me rephrase that. We get some people on our shows that have done some terrible things, but it doesn't make them terrible people. I mean, if I go back, which maybe we will today, because I don't normally talk about myself, I've done some things I'm not overly proud of. It doesn't make me a bad person because I've acknowledged them. And so when I have somebody opposite me and I, they've had a rocky past, I sort of want to see beyond that. But I see a lot of sadness in a lot of people's eyes and a lot of misery behind people's smiles. And I just feel like something needs to change in the atmosphere at the moment. I think people watching this will be able to relate or, or these words will resonate that the, 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 the country, which has a ripple effect, and it all starts from the family unit. I think a lot of people are feeling trepidation for the future. Where do we go? What can we say? Who can we trust? And there's just not a band of brothers anymore. Mm. And I want, I, want to, I, want that to, I want that to come back. I want the band of brothers, people sticking together, being good friends, loving thy neighbor. I'm not a religious guy, but I would love to see Christian values brought back to the UK because I think the country is, is lost. And I don't want this to be a political podcast. We'll just go with the flow. But mm -hmm. just to get it out there, podcasting has been extremely fascinating for me. And I wanted to start the podcast to learn. That's really the, the purpose. I mean, it's a business as well. Let's not, let's not beat around the bush. It's a business. But in order to do that, you have, you know, your other businesses have to take a back seat or they certainly get neglected. And then you've got, you know, what's the most important? What gives me the most fulfillment? No other business I've ever done has really given me fulfillment, like my security company. We, you, it's a thankless task. You don't complete a weekend shift of sending armies of men on, on the front line of pubs and clubs and then afterwards feel a real great sense of achievement because no matter how many people you protect or save or get out of trouble or turn on their side because they're, they're just about to choke on their tongue, you're only as good as your last 10 minutes when you're doing the door because the next incident takes place. And if you don't deal with that, you'll get lambasted and chastised. Whereas with the podcast, you know, I feel like it's a journey I can go on and use the skills that I've learned along the way and just keep, just keep pouring my energy into people that I feel that need it. But more importantly, I reached the cap and I'm fucking bored of me. This is going to feel strange talking about me today, but I'm sort of bored of me. I've lived in my head for 44 years. I want to hear about other people's lives and experiences and their ups and downs. And, and the more people you speak to, the more you realize we're not all that different. I mean, we are, but also we're not. A little bit of fine tuning a bit of, and a bit of tweaking. We can definitely pull together a little bit more. But yeah, this is a good, this is a good learning curve for me. And I'm speaking to people that are far brighter than me and far more qualified to discuss certain topics and this is now how I'm learning because I can't read well I, I mean that's a silly thing to say I can read 
but I've got no interest in reading. I get to the third line and then I have to go back to the first line. And that goes on repeat because I'm thinking about fucking pina coladas <laughs> in, in, in a gym changing room. My, my mind has fucking wild thoughts, <laughs> just random thoughts coming in. Do you think you're on the spectrum? Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, and the more people I've spoke to about autism, ADHD, OCD, it's like, well, yeah, that's me. Of course it fucking is. I can't stick to one thought at a time if my life depended on it. I wake up in the middle of the night laughing like a maniac. <laughs> something's, something's come into my head and it's triggered me off. And I just end up going on a, on a, on a laughing spree, which is insane. I mean, but I'd, I'd, I'd sooner wake up laughing than wake up crying, don't get me wrong. But yeah, I would say, I would say I'm definitely somewhere on the spectrum, but I think, I think a lot more people are than we, than we think. And the phone is causing that. Mm. And I wonder where we're going to be in, wonder where the adult brain will be in, say, 20 years' time. Children now, they're not playing knockdown ginger. They're not playing Kirby like we used to do. They're not playing 40-40. They're not playing in the park. They're sat in their room talking to strangers on an iPad. And when you're scrolling through TikTok, that, that's, that's a slot machine. That's like an adult being in Vegas. That's, we're, we've got a generation of junkies, gambling junkies. That's what that is, that dopamine. Scroll, scroll, scroll. Attention span is just reducing, reducing, reducing. Social skills are completely suppressing this is all purposely done i'm sure to dumb the west down but that's a that's a complete another route we can take but yeah again i wonder talk being talking about being on the spectrum which i would say i am and anybody that has children where their teachers have said oh can you come in for a meeting please you know i i, I think little toby we, we should we should put him through some you know put him through some tests because you know he's different and we, we think you know, he could have autism or anything like that. You know, if you if parents are watching this and they've had their, their meetings with them teachers, don't go home and think the world's over because also ADHD, OCD, all these fucking labels. labels. I believe if channeled correctly, they can be used as a superpower because ADHD for me, if I'm not interested in something, I literally cannot focus for a split second. If I'm really, really interested in something, laser focus on that to the, to the point of exhaustion. So if that helps or soothes anybody that's going through a time where autism's being discussed in the household, don't sweat it. In 20 years time, everyone's going to be like that because the screen, the phones, the iPads, the YouTubes, the scrolling, it's all doing the same to everybody's brain. It's scrambling it, it's frying it up and tossing it around. And yeah, I wonder where it's going to go. Yeah, it's scary times. I think people are confused. But the first podcast we done, it was all about your father. Um, a very well-known criminal in the underworld, very connected to the craze and all the other top boys. We spoke about it right in depth, about prisons, all the other stuff that went with it, but there's a lot more to your story. There's a lot more layers to your story, working on the doors, security firms, you've been stabbed, fucking kidnapped. You've done a lot of madness yourself. We'll not speak on too much because we don't want to incriminate you. The last thing I want <laughs> is to go to prison, but there's more depth to your story for people to get an understanding who actually Liam Tufts is. Mm. On the first podcast, I'd says I'd knew you 10, over 10 years ago, probably from your Facebook post, your dancing. And it was very, you were viral then. Everybody knows what it is now, but nobody really understood Facebook back then and mm. how big it can get because you had nearly a million followers. Obviously, you kept getting deplatformed with the stuff that you were posting. Things have changed. We've now connected, done the first podcast. Now here we are. What about the bouncing the doors? How did you end up getting involved in that? And at what age? Because it was very early for you. Eh? Yeah, I was young when I started the doors. So I was a fucking handful when I was younger. There's no ifs, buts or maybes. And anyone that's interested as to why I was a handful, we're not going to go over old ground. Go and watch part one. Uh, when I was on James's show around 18 months ago. That'll give you a better understanding as, as to why I respond in certain ways to certain things. 
Sometimes it can be, it certainly was excessive. I've learned to understand myself far better over the years. But so I was a handful. I was very aggressive, very reactive, very protective. I mean, you know this by now, I'll, I'll take a bullet for my friends. Whether that's to my detriment or not, whether they would for me, who knows, who cares, certainly not me. I feel like that's another one of my purposes, to protect my friends that I love. And I've been like that since day one. So having a father like mine, who was hyper-violent, hyper-aggressive, glamorized violence, extreme violence, I was desensitized to violence from a very, very young age. I would watch my old man kick the fucking daylights out of people in broad daylight in the middle of the street and then get back in his car like it was just another day in the office. So I was desensitized to that. And also, don't forget, from a very young age as well, I was wrapped around people like Reg Cray. I say wrapped around. I'd go and visit him in jail. And they're the kind of conversations you're exposed to. So you're listening to violence, you're seeing violence, you're watching violence. As you know, I was exposed to pornography uh, by my dad at a young age, which we, we, can, we can touch base on down the line. But also I was exposed to violence. So I always thought to solve things, you use violence. But I need to put this caveat in that never, ever, ever was I a bully, which is why I believe I've never been to jail. If I'd have been convicted for all of the things that I've done, which is the fights, I've never been a career criminal, I've never stolen anything in my life, I've never betrayed anybody, I've never defrauded anybody or any, any corporation, but my Achilles heel was my temperament and my outlook to, my resolution outlook. This is how we get this resolved. Words aren't working. We're going to go straight from 0 to 60. So... I was fighting in schools. I also thought that's what my dad would want me to do. I thought that would... All kids do. Every kid looks at their dad as their hero. And although my time with him was infrequent, he was still, at the time, a somebody. So I'd be fighting at school. That was standard. But I don't want to sound like, you know, I deserve a fucking cape. And I'm not trying to polish my own halo. But there was always reason for it. I'd never, ever have... The geek bullied, not on my fucking watch. No, no one's going to take liberties with anyone that's less capable or vulnerable. So a lot of my fights really were sticking up for people that couldn't stick up for themselves. And I've always been a bit of a justice warrior in that sense. And when I look back over my life, because I've, you've got to look backwards to work out why you're here and how we tick. I've always wanted to look after people. Every single thing I've ever set up, business-wise, setting up a security firm, I want to keep people safe. I want to keep nice people safe and protect them from the people that want to destroy that evening for them. It's all subconscious that I've never really thought of until I sat down and wanted to analyze bit by bit where I'd come from and how I'd grown and evolved and how I've looked inward. So fighting at school and then I'd go and visit my dad in jail. So then I'd be fighting in, in jails as well in the, in, the, in, in the kids area. Fighting, fighting, fighting. Got expelled from all my lower schools in Crawley, then moved over to East Grinstead. And then I got tangled up in drugs, which was encouraged, delivered, fed to me by my dad at a very young age, as we know from part one, from the ages of 14, 15. And so around 16 years of age, I was looking back, very, very confused, man. Very confused, very angry, very aggressive and in survival mode. That's what it is. If I'm honest, looking back, my inner child, I mean, we're all children. We're still children. You and me now sat here, I'm bald as a coot. We've got hairy backs. We're still children. That inner child is always there. And it's very easy to tap into it if the right words are said or you're put in the right environment. So I'm walking around 16 years of age, although I was very brave and violent and I would fight fully grown men, I'm still a scared child in there. That's, that's, that's the truth of it. And I think a lot of people that lash out with violence, it's because the child in them is being damaged. You could translate that to ego, I don't know. But for me, I've always lashed out if I ever feel fear. 
because I, 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 perhaps I feel fear more than most people, which is why I'm prepared to go further than most people because I don't like being in that position. So I'd go out and I'd fight a lot, a hell of a lot. And I'd, all, and I'd actually reflect and think, I'm getting in all these fights. Is it me? Am I the problem here? But I was just very quick to react. So I started working down the local club, the base in East Grinstead. See, back in the day, 90, 1996, a lot of people for me, London, Brighton, even up north will remember this nightclub because it was one of the first of its kind. So people would travel far and wide to come down to this club. So I started getting in there from a young age and I worked down there as a bottle boy. I can't remember exactly how, how old I was. Then I think drugs were still in my system, so I was more keen on dancing around and fucking about. But they got to a stage where it was, it was, all, it was always fighting. You're going out with your mates. It's kicking off. And I've also analysed this as well. So when I'm going to nightclubs and my friends are in a predicament and a big fight erupts, and even years later, even working the door, running into groups of men, I didn't realise that that was a form of self-harm because I, you know, I'm no stranger to self-soothing, addictions, getting my comfort over the years from food, drink, drugs, porn, you name it, any kind of dopamine, I've been hooked on it. And, that, and, and I was asked by a, a clinical psychotherapist, have you ever indulged in self-harm? And I said, no, 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 no. I associate self-harm with cutting your arms, slicing yourself in places where nobody can see because momentarily that takes away the pain. No different to a, a heroin addict shooting up, just taking away that pain. And then when we got further on in our conversation and she asked me about fighting and violence and all that sort of stuff, because you don't get to run a security firm and put men out on doors and pubs and clubs and events if you haven't had a past that includes violence. You're just not qualified to do that. You're in no position to, to be in a, in a place where you can protect anybody because you've, it's an alien environment. So she obviously tapped into that. And then when I would explain to her that I would happily, without giving it a second thought, wade into groups of men. I've waded into groups of men with weapons. She said, that was the self-harm. And I like to think about people's comments. People far more qualified than me. And rather than respond with, nah, it was, you know, I just, I just like fighting. I was like, hang about, I've never thought about that angle. That is self-harm. So the process of me covering from all the abuse I received from my old man, that was my, that was my survival self-harm. Fighting excessively, fighting when the odds were stacked against me, knowing that I'm not going to beat. I mean, even the chances of beating one man in a street fight is, is difficult. It's either 50-50 or maybe 30-70 against me. I've never done, I've never done jujitsu or boxing or any, anything like that. But still, I would go in. Win, lose or draw, didn't care. I've still kind of got that temperament now. So anyway... This is sort of like a long-winded psychological response, but it gives context and understanding if anyone else is doing the same thing or done the same thing and can't, why, can't quite work out, am I the problem? So I would fight, fight, fight and fight. And I had a big problem with authority when I was younger. If, if I don't mind being asked to do something and it's like, yeah, fine, no problem at all. But I don't, I don't want to be told. I don't, want to, I don't want someone to try and dominate me I want an exchange of value across the board. You speak to me nicely, I'll speak to you nicely. And back in the day, as we know, 96, 97, 98, 99, 2000, doormen were bouncers. They were bouncers. They weren't customer service, excuse me, sir, do you think perhaps I could have a word with a SIA badge? They were bouncers. If they wanted you to move, they'd shove you out of the way. If they wanted you to drink up, they'd take the fucking pint out of your hand, grab you around the neck, because normally they were, they were great big fucking steroid lumps. It was just a different mentality back then. Some of those, 
some of those old school bouncers are very, you know, they're gone. They're never coming back because the way the industry has changed. Some of them are pieces of shit. Some of them are bullying, horrible, nasty bits of shit that would want to turn up to work to purposely hurt someone to get their kicks. Dogs. Never would I associate with someone like that. Never would I have somebody like that work for me. And that was the type of bouncer that I had a real problem with. And I would go into them like a wild fucking animal. If a doorman, when I was in a club, especially filled with booze, if a doorman tried bullying me about, shoving me around, telling me what's going to fucking happen, any hands put on me whatsoever, there was, no, there was no more conversation. I would go from 0 to 60 like you've never seen. And I would go fucking all out. It was madness, really. When I think about the level of violence I used to enforce, it was fucking insane. But in my mind, it was justified. I will not be bullied. I've been abused by my own fucking father. Do you think I'm going to let you do something that reminds me of that? You're fucking wrong. Don't touch me. Don't talk to me disrespectfully. Don't think you can fucking bully me because you're twice my size and twice my age. And in my head, I know that's what I'm thinking. So, bam, I would fight Dorman. I mean, I'm never going to beat a team of Dorman. But fucking at least one of them is going to be banging trouble. Because I'm not, there's no words. There's no pre-warning. Once they come at me, I'm, I'm at them. And this is at a young age. So, it was, they had the shock factor as well. Because I used to have a baby face. So you wouldn't expect someone like me to have such a vicious fucking temper where I'm all in. Full of fury and anger, anger and hatred and venom. And all I can see is somebody kind of reminds me of my old man bullying me. It will not happen. So this would go on for quite some time. And then agency door staff started moving in to this club that I would go to. And they had to keep changing certain doormen because I'd end up weighing them in. And they didn't ban me because the world was different back then. We sort of policed ourselves in our own community. And I was always fair. I'd look after anyone that was less capable, anybody vulnerable. I've said it before and I'll say it till I'm, to the day I die. No one will get away with bullying someone in front of me. If they're a good person, you fucking treat them well. So after this agency of bouncers had to keep like not returning to the club because I'd had a serious problem with them, again, I was reacting to their disproportionate behaviour, shall we say. The head doorman who was on the door that night, his name's Nick Chapman. He, he ended up becoming very good mates with Dave Courtney. He's out of Horsham. He said to me, Liam, he said, can I have a word? I'm like, yeah, of course, like, as long as it's just a word. He said, yeah. He said, you can't keep weighing my doorman in. He goes, we can't keep replacing doorman week after week. He said, why don't you come and work with us? I said, nah, you're fucking joking, isn't you? I fucking hate doorman because they, they're bullies. He said, no, nah, they're not all bullies. Just come, come, come the other side, put the booze down, come and work with us, see how it goes. And this was on the Friday night. And I thought, why not? <laughs> I thought, why not? I said, when we talking? He said, when can you start? I said, I'll be here tomorrow. The very next day, I started working the door and I never looked back. And then I saw it from the other person's eyes that... Drunk people can be very unreasonable. They can be very unnecessary. They can be excessively violent. They don't listen. They repeat themselves a hundred times. Please, can you stop shouting and swearing because other people want to have a nice night? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they just carry on. Excuse me, mate. Remember that thing I, I asked you not to do 20 seconds ago? Do you mind not doing that? Yeah. And then, and then they don't like you telling it. No one likes being told what to do. But... I was very good on the door, if, if I don't mind saying so myself, because... Did you change? I changed. From the violent, aggressive to then more calmer? I, yes. I become very calm, 
very understanding, very sympathetic. Yeah, I've become a far more rounded human being, although there were, you know, there have been a couple of occasions where I've gone to absolute town on people that have been in a club. Both the occasions were when women were under attack. And again, I've looked back on that. It's like there's sort of been two or three occasions where it's gone, it's gone bandy and I've really gone in. Over the top, in fact. But two of those occasions were where women were getting levelled. One was off the cuff and the other, I waited 24 hours and I still had that fury in me. Like, no one's going no to gonna headbutt a woman in front of me. No one. And again, when I think back, because I like to know why I am the way I am, I was raised by two women. My dad's absent, my mum and my nan, my heroes, they raised me. So, intrinsically... I'm protective over women. In the UK, we open the doors for women. We put our jackets over puddles. We pull their seat back. We check they're okay. We don't fucking start beating them around and abusing them and slapping them about. Who the fuck do you think you are? So I could go off on that because, again, subconsciously, I have a big issue with people that are going to bully people less able. But going back to the door, did it change me? it did change me it did change me I saw the world through different eyes and you can sort of take that philosophy for the rest of your life just don't be pig headed with tunnel vision like listen to other people which is why conversations like this are good and podcasting is good okay little bits and pieces I've seen about you I don't really agree with your views or you know your behaviour let's have a chat I want to know why you behave like that and then all of a sudden you can get a better understanding so yeah I did change and I was very grown up also as a young man. Oh, so? Because my dad made sure I was a man. I was, his, I was his best man at his wedding when I was 10. I was exposed to pornography at a young age, extreme violence. My language was terrible. I mean, believe it or not, my language is now better than it was when I was 10. <laughs> I've worked on elimin eliminating the, 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 the swear words. So it's one thing that's always made my mum sad. She said, you never... You never really had the freedom to be a child. And my mum tried her and she did do her very best. And she, thank God for her, she provided me, she furnished me with, a, with, with love and a very, very beautiful childhood. And it's only the little snippets that my old man had his influence, but it was enough. I mean, all, all it takes is one clear glass of water. You put one drop of black currant in that glass, it changes colour. You don't need much bad in you to pollute you so yeah it changed my perspective I was very good at talking people down very good because it's that feel felt found I can see it in your eyes I know how you feel I've had that happen to me and I felt the same way but when I acted like this this is what I found feel felt found I get you I've been there this is what I've done to rectify that you don't need to throw your life away getting arrested by throwing lefts and rights in the middle of the street because you've had an argument with somebody you don't need to go and fucking break someone's jaw because they've spilt your pint grow up it's not cool be a man men don't do that not honourable men so I'll be sort of bringing psychology into the fucking job I was a good voice of reason but if I ever saw a situation where talking wasn't an option, then I would, I would revert back to default setting what I knew best, which was just brute force and aggression. And in my mind, it was, it was justified. What was easier? Violence. Because that's what you knew? No, because it's, it's adrenaline fueled and it's an immediate response you don't have time to think. I'm, let's say, 50 metres, because back in the day as well, you didn't have radios on the door. I'd see a woman getting headbutted in the face by a man. And I'm not, I'm not talking about a subtle headbutt. I'm talking about grabbing her and headbutting her like she's a man. You haven't got time to think, assess the situation, be concerned about what you're going to do and how far you're going to take it. You just know instinctively and morally that has to stop immediately. You just then run and you 
steam into that man like he's a defenseless punch bag, which on this one occasion I'm thinking of, I can picture it, which is, which is why I'm using this example. You know, there's... There was no, there was no dick measuring. I, I, I can't. Nobody can say Cor Liam's a tough guy for what he done. The bloke didn't even see it coming. I steamed into him like he was a fucking punch bag. He had his arms by his side. He didn't even see me. Didn't even see me run into him. But I wasn't going to give him the honour of a toe to toe and a, and a straightener. I've just seen you headbutt a woman in the face with all of your might. Something's going to happen now, real bad. And it did. It did happen. I went in and I used excessive force. Again, it triggered me. Maybe now I'd react differently. I don't know. It's easier said than done. Mm. It's easier said than done. When, 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 you see a, when you see an act of grotesque violence like that against a female, it does something to you. I believe if you're a decent human being, it, it taps into all the things that you suppress as a man because you know that if I behave like that, I'm going to jail. If I behave like that... Uh, I'm not going to be very popular. If I behave like that, I'm not going to be able to sleep at night because it's not a decent thing to do. But you see a woman get beaten senseless like that, I'm sort of willing to be labelled anything you want to call me. A savage, an animal, I don't give a fuck. So, yeah. What's the worst door you worked on? The worst door... Well, I would say Caesars in Streatham was, was bad for violence. Very, very bad for violence because you'd get all, anyone that was anyone in the underworld would go there. Uh, and Joe Pohl, well, Joe Pohl Sr. would go there back in the day. You'd have Frankie Fraser, the Lambrianos, Dave Courtney was a regular face down there. You had some real Roy Shaw funny story when I was working the door there and I asked Roy Shaw to take a search I'm working with a there's four of us at, at, the, at the front and then you have to come through like a metal detector and all these people are coming through and all, and, and all the boat races and Roy Shaw's walk, walk through with a, with a purple pastel suit on you know still look fit as a fiddle still had that wild look in his eye and as he's come through you know all, all the doorman there he gets treated like like Roy I said come and take a search sir and his face had gone like that, and the doormans. I was working with a geezer called Drake Blackfella. He turned white. He's, <laughs> he's, he's looked at me. Love Drake, if you're watching. Yeah, he's looked at me as if to say, you can't fucking say that to Roy Shaw. But I'm looking at Roy Shaw's eyes the whole time. And I, you know, I was like, I'm only joking, mate. Of course, of course, we're not, you're not going to take a search. But I would always be the clown as well. I'm a fucking weird fucker, mate. One minute I can be the one that calms everything down. Then I'm the one cracking all the jokes just to ease the tension. But then something really bad will happen. It's like, well, I've, I've now lost that. I've, I've now lost them personality traits and it's got to go to violence. But that was, a, that was an interesting door. The worst, it's sort of the best and the worst. It was the, you'd, it'd be the worst eruptions of violence you've ever fucking seen. People end up getting guns in there. Some very, very bad things took place in there because you'd get rival firms. You know, it's fucking smack bang in the middle of Streatham. Brixton one end, Norwood another. You're just surrounded by just rough and ready individuals and gangsters and villains and people that wanted to be gangsters and villains, people that wanted to prove themselves, get a name for themselves. That's a great place to go. You've got loads of trophies to choose from. Which person am I going to take out or attempt to take out or have a pop at to get myself up the rankings? But when you would deal with a situation in the Caesars in Streatham, people watching this, I've interviewed Colin Wilby, used to fight there regularly. Joe Pohl Jr., I interviewed him on my podcast, funny enough, only a few weeks ago. He used to run uh, Mean Machine Promotions, which was the Sunday show, which was all the unlicensed fights. So they'll concur. When it went off, in Caesars. It went off in a royal fashion. You'd have hundred man brawls, chairs, tables, fucking punches and kicks being flown from every angle conceivable. And then the door team, because what I would do is there, I would take extra men on a Sunday from my firm to go and support the door team that were working at the time. Only for a short period of time, but it was, well, it was, it was long enough to get, to get a good feel for the place and just know, whew, 
when it goes off in here, you better be on your guard because it's fucking serious business. But if it's all kicking off, you'd go and grab somebody up or steam into people. And the thing is, I've never been a particularly big guy. So when there's violence, I can only really, I only ever was able to respond with violence because I'm not a big steroid guy that can, that can use, you know, his strength and size to get somebody out. And it's not like I'm a jujitsu expert or I can get somebody in one of them funky locks and say, right, that's enough of that. I have to go in all guns are blazing. And you do that there and you'll have the regular door team there that know who's who, who the faces are, who's dangerous, who's connected. And they'd say, no, don't, don't, don't do that to him. Leave them alone. And then you'd go and try and pacify another group of people that are fighting and you've got to use force sometimes. And then they'd say, no, don't go near them, don't go near them either. It's like, well, I'm just gonna have to sit back and let them fucking kill themselves then. So a lot of the time in seasons, I found that you'd literally have to let it erupt and wait until everyone was exhausted and then sort of pick up the debris and whoever needed an ambulance rung, you'd get an ambulance for them. There'd normally be paramedics outside seasons anyway. There was always, and a fucking line of police with truncheons and batons outside the front. Never did I see him come in the venue. Never ever did I see him come in the venue once. They probably also thought to themselves, fuck that. <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll wait. But the worst incident I ever saw was in Sittingbourne, which is in Kent. And not many people would have even heard of that town. Terrible way of getting people out of the club. There was, must have been a hundred plus steps really, really steep. And to get them out of the club, it had to be from top to bottom. I've seen a man get knocked from the top of the stairs and land at the bottom of the stairs and his head hit the floor and it sounded like a fucking bowling ball hitting concrete. I just thought this guy's dead. There's no way he's going to survive that. And there was no way of dealing with it. As people, as people are coming out, you've got this little enclosure, crack out of nowhere, bam. Horrible to see. He lives to tell the story, which was, it blew my mind. But there was a guy there. There was, I won't say their name, and I'm sure if you fucking put in sitting born and do a little bit of research, uh, there was two brothers from there. And around the corner from this club, it's called JJ's. People will remember JJ's in sitting born. We've had this girl fight kicked off in the club. We've got everybody out safely. And I want to make it clear, in amongst all the war stories, which I'm never actually comfortable talking about because I'm just, I'm not that guy. My first and foremost objective and desire every time I put on that suit was to make sure nobody got hurt. That was my intention. Go to work tonight and make sure no decent human beings get injured, bullied, beaten, scarred. Because back then it was all like, everyone was glassing people in the face and using bottles and the pubs and clubs have changed over the years. You tend to find the troubles now out of the, out of the venues, but back in the day, the trouble was in the venues. So if I can get somebody out unscathed, I've done my job. If I can put somebody in a recovery position, get them to safety, I've done my job. Not easy, but you do what you got to do. So anyway, we've managed to deal with this situation, take them down them steep stairs, and then get them out and disperse them. And then it was under, I'm trying to think, like a walkway of shops either side, and it was sealed off. And then you've got car parks either side. That's how I remember it anyway. Somebody might correct me in the comments and I'll be interested to know the actual layout because once you've dealt with a situation and you realize that you know in your vicinity, no one's getting beaten up, no one's being jumped on and everything seems like it's calm. That's now the police's job to deal with public disorder on the street. That's no longer the doorman's job because Tensions are still high in the club and you need to get back in there to make sure that it's not kicking off again. So once you've dealt with the situation in the club, you've got them out safely, you've made sure it's not kicking off in front of you, in your space, and you've dispersed everybody, you think, okay, that's, th that's, that's that part of the job done. People are safe. You then get back to it. 
up the stairs, any more violence, nine times out of 10, it is kicking off again because violence and aggression is contagious. It's in the air. People can feel it and taste it and it infects them. And then it kicks off, it kicks off. Once you get the first fight of a night in a nightclub, you can guarantee there's going to be five, six more. It's in the air. But anyway, this was probably my worst memory of the door was after we dispersed everybody and then we gone back, brought more people out. This woman has come running round from this car park around the, around the corner. Well out of our, our view, like a fair distance away. Screaming and crying like she just witnessed a murder. And I thought she had. So we run round to see what, and she's saying, they've killed him, they've killed him, they've killed him, he's dead. So we run round there and there's this guy on the floor in such a terrible condition, he looked like he'd been hit by a train. It wasn't pleasant. And that memory stuck with me for, for quite, well, it still sticks with me now because I'm talking about it. I'd never seen a man beaten so badly. I'd, and, and, I've, and I've seen a fair share of atrocious sights that would make most people's heads spin. But this was something quite different. He was unrecognisable, absolutely covered in blood, the f a faint gargle, which let you know that he was still just about breathing. But I didn't think he was going to make it. Paramedics come, took him away, and then it's, it's then down to them. And then shortly after that, another incident took place on New Year's Eve and the club got closed. It was just, uh, it, was like yeah. the wild, it was like the Wild West in there. Yeah, but that, that poor guy that got beaten senseless, to say it haunted me may be too strong, but it wasn't a one-on-one -on -one fight. I know that because I got witness statements. There was multiple people kicking the living daylights out of him, putting him in a, in a state where he was unrecognisable, covered in blood, gasping for air. They would have broke his fucking ribs, done his kidneys. His old face was completely and utterly smashed in. Yeah, it was a horrendous scene. So that was my worst experience working the door. Who was the most respected that you'd seen come through the doors in the underworld? Roy Shaw got the utmost respect in, in Caesars. Because he can scrap. Though everybody had been shanking himself. Yeah, and even, even, even as, as an older man, he got a, a great deal of respect. Dave Courtney got a lot of respect. In Caesars, he got, a, he got a hell of a lot of respect in there. And it's funny the different stories you hear about Dave. Yeah, I like Dave. Yeah, I've I was, always liked Dave. Yeah, yeah, he was... he come across kind. Even though he was part of the criminal fraternity, to me, he just seemed like he was the middleman. And some of the times, he was, he was the voice of reason. And, and I personally know that Dave Courtney is responsible for saving people's lives. I know that people were going to get in a whole world of trouble and Dave put a stop to it. Dave made a phone call and said, please don't do that. And he managed to squash a lot of people's problems. So from what I've seen of Dave and what I've known of Dave, I, the more I get to know about Dave, the more fond of him I grow. And I was the, I was the last person to, to, interview. to interview Dave. And that was quite... That was quite something because we've gone for coffee first and he turned up Dave Courtney. Flamboyant. In character, wearing the suit. He was Dave Courtney and it was great because, you know, he's, he's a character. He's a, he's a caricature of himself. And we've all got, we've all got a front. There's a, we've all got an alter ego. We've all got somebody else we can tap into. Uh, and Dave done that very well. That Dave, you know, he, he could have gone on. His whole life could have took a very different avenue, I feel, because he had a lot of charm and charisma. And I saw the kindness in him. And then after, and I'll, and I'll get to this because I've obviously, I've, I've, done, I've done the trilogy. I've interviewed his wife, Jenny, who's a fabulous human being. And I've interviewed his best mate, Brendan, who found Dave dead. So I've really, really dug into that story. And... The more people that you speak to that knew him really well, because I didn't know him well, but the more people you know that knew him well, 
He was kind. He would always have the strays in a spare room. He wouldn't have anybody sleep rough. He wouldn't have anybody go skint. And so he was respected. And going back to the interview, when he turned up as Dave Courtney, that's how he turned up. Very entertaining. And the thing is with me is I don't like, I like to get under the bonnet of stuff. Because I know that I can be a character if I want if I want to be. But it's like, let's not both let our alter egos communicate. Let's feel each other's real energy. Let's get to the core of the human being. And so I did. We had the, you know, we had the alpha mouth thing while we we're having the coffee first at the uh, the grave time manor in East Grinstead. I bet they couldn't believe what they were seeing. It's like a big old country house, very, very posh. Butlers greet you at the door. And there's me, Dave Courtney, and another couple of blokes walking in for a coffee. Dave drank milk. And uh, so once everything calmed down and we could have a we could have a good back and forth, I just knew that I'm gonna I'm gonna get the real Dave Courtney here. I'm gonna I'm gonna get the I'm gonna get the man, not the character. So there was a lot that, that was said and done off camera as well. But during the interview, you could see he was his authentic, organic self. Did you see anything yeah. behind the eyes? Did you see anything missing? Because when I interviewed him five, six years ago, it was very big energy, very welcoming. Mm. And obviously at the end, with the video that he released to say, like, for me, listen, taking your own life is one of the bravest things you can do. Sad, mm. but for him to do it in the way he did with the video, to say, listen... I'm doing it in my terms, and then bang, gone. Did you, was there any telltale signs when you interviewed them then? There was a telltale sign that he was in tremendous pain. So for me, he had to go to a hospital appointment. And yeah, all his joints, his arthritis, he was, he was in a very, very bad place physically. And as we know, you know, even with a shoulder injury, if you can't train for six weeks, you'll start getting depressed. So he, he must have been very unhappy. So I could see the physical pain in him. And then we, when we started touching on certain topics, especially Jenny, the love of his life, and I have to give, I have to give her a, a shout out because she's endured some trauma in her life and she still stands tall like a warrior. And I respect her greatly. So when I was talking to Dave about Jenny, I could then see his whole demeanor change. The clogs in his brain were turning. Heartache was kicking in and he was just completely open. He said, I've never been the same since me and Jenny split up. He, he took heartbreak to his grave. So I could see that he was still heartbroken. I could see that he was in physical pain. I could see there was something not right because at the start he was also quite aggy. Sort of, I had to kind of disarm him. Uh, and then this was the thing. When we got up and we finished the interview, we had a cuddle. But when we had a cuddle, he wanted to be cuddled. He wanted to be cuddled. And I don't think he'll mind me saying that because we were very honest with each other. And I thought that was... It was a beautiful way to behave because he spent his whole life being this character. And I feel like he felt a little bit of strength for me because I related with him and I understood him and I gave him the utmost respect across the table, which I do everybody for that, for that matter. That, that is my job to give everybody respect that sits in front of me because they're, they're being vulnerable in front of me. And then he said, I've got to do on at my house on, it could have been maybe three Fridays after, you know, if you want to turn up, come early, we can have a few drinks first. And I said, oh, my diary is rampant, particularly on a Friday, because that would be the days that I'd record my podcast. I said, my diary is absolutely rampant for the next three months. I said, let me just get the runway clear and then I'll come and see you. And he said, don't say you're going to come and see me if you're not going to come and see me, Liam. With a smile on his face. And I said, Dave, I said, anyone that knows me will tell you I do not and will not and never have 
broke my word. If I say I'm going to be there, I'm going to be there. If I say I'm going to do something, I'll do it. I said, I will absolutely die on my sword. I mean, you probably even know that now after 18 months of you and me getting on like house on fire. I'm there. And if I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. And then when he went, I said to my cousin who you've met, Simon, I said, there was unfinished business there. I said, there's unfinished business there with me and Dave. We're all sensory. We all work off vibration, energy, especially in this game. For, for, for those that haven't done this with cameras in your face and lights in your face and just exposed yourself and shown all your vulnerabilities, it's a deep energy. It's, it's heavy at times. And that energy told me that there's unfinished business there. From the emotion he revealed, from the cuddle at the end to the come and see me and don't say you're going to see me if you're not, I think... I think Dave Courtney wanted to tell me that he was going to commit suicide. And when I look back on that interview, and I've watched it back several times, and I, I, I tend not to watch things back, apart from if I want to take clips from it to post. But I watched it back time and time again, thinking I was sat there talking to a dead man walking. He knew. He sat opposite me, and he knew that when the time felt right, he was taking his own life. He was clocking out of this place and he was gone. And Brendan was also there. Dave come, he brought the cavalry with him. And back then I used to do the podcast in my house. So I had an absolute house full as well. And he brought Brendan with him, his best friend. And Brendan also knew that his best friend was lining up his own suicide. How long did he know for? He knew for quite some time, a considerable amount of time. And, and I think it could be as long as two years he knew because I've interviewed him as well. Was there a certain day he was going to pick or was it just any day? When it felt right, he was he was clocking out and Brendan didn't even see it coming. And when, when Brendan was telling me the story of Dave taking his life, I had to fight everything I had not to cry. In fact... You may look at me back on that podcast when I'm interviewing Brendan and say that I did cry because my eyes were certainly full of water to the brim. If I'd have blinked, they would have streamed down my face because I, again, I saw the pain in his best friend's face. I mean, how do you make sense of that? They lived together for years. They were like, well, Dave and, Jen, uh, Dave and Jenny were like Bonnie and Clyde and Dave and Brendan were like, Clyde and Clyde. Dave was the, was the muscle. Brendan was the humour. It was the perfect storm. They worked really well together. And as he's telling me the story about saying goodnight to Dave, in his mind, I'll see you in the morning, Dave, just like any other day because they live together. And then he woke up and then he finds his best friend dead with a bullet wound to his head. I just thought, how do you make sense of that? How do you move on from that? How do you cope and recover from that? That's a vision that's going to be embedded in his brain till his final breath also. And so I saw that pain in his eye behind the smile because most of the interview was, was laughing and joking. But then when it comes to the crunch, the important stuff that needs to, needs to be aired, I saw some serious pain in and misery in his face. And I, I, I would be exactly the same. If I was ever to find one of my friends dead, it would destroy me like you wouldn't believe. And then you've got Jenny, his wife. Again, I mean, Dave impacted a lot of people. He impacted a lot of people. So that was a big decision for him to make. For Dave Courtney to kill himself, that is a huge decision to make because he knows that he was loved and adored by plenty of people when he was people's rock and he was a father and he was a best friend and he was a boyfriend because Jenny and his relationship did come to an end after a while because of severe circumstances. If you, if you want to watch them interviews, you can find out. Although they've shared the story with me, I still sometimes feel like, well, it's not my story to share, but there was something monumental that took place that led to their separation. Neither of them ever recovered. How about that? Imagine that. You separate from somebody that you cannot live without and you spend the rest of your years suffering. How fucking cruel is that? It was his last message, his final message mm. before he took his own life to do that video, to say, listen, 
I'm in pain. Mm-hmm. I can't take it anymore. And I'm going in my own terms. And to do that, that takes a mass amount of balls. I don't care who you are, what you are. To do that, to then say, it's, I'm done, I'm tired, I've had a great life. Mm. Oh, it's been brilliant and he was laughing. And then to do that, like it's mass respect. And I've always liked Dave. I know people now is, and it's sad because a lot of these men got older mm. and people in the comments as if they're fucking idiots. They were all capable. Mm. Same as guys like Carlton Leach. Carlton Leach was so capable back in the day mm. with the ICF and the things that he's done, the things that he was connected to. They get a bit older. Carlton's 65. I still think he looks great and people are talking shit. Same mm. as Dave. He's this and that. That was their characters. But in their day, they were so well respected. People get older. But for that message and video message, I thought, wow, I respected that. Sad, but I respected that. Yeah, same. It was it was very, very sad. And because I've got a bit of a connection with that, with the whole legacy and, you know, the whole sort of trilogy of it all, the, the nearest and dearest and Dave, yeah, it, 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 struck a, it struck a call with me. And when I watched the, the main suicide video, as opposed to a note, and he's in his tracksuit top and he's very cavalier in his approach, how he's talking about how he's basically going to clock out. And uh, it was when he sort of shrugged his shoulders and said, I'll do what I want. That was the moment I thought, kudos to you. Kudos to you. And this is, this will, there'll be a divide in the comments here about suicide. Because also, I've got close friends that have lost parents and friends and partners to suicide. And I interviewed uh, an undertaker very recently, John O'Looney. And I give people a safe space to, to open up and be them themselves. Very rarely would I challenge anybody unless it's something I feel particularly strong about, which I have done on a couple of occasions. Uh, But he was saying that committing suicide is one of the most selfish acts you can take because all you do is transfer the pain onto the people that care about you the most. And I get that. There's no argument there. But also, taking your own life, to be in the headspace where you want to end it all. I mean, I've been in some horrendous positions. I mean, my my brain has been like porridge before. I've hit rock bottom and sort of haven't seen any way out. I stuck around to make damn sure I could find a way out. But to feel even worse than that, to be in that headspace, to then think, I'm going to end it. Unless you felt as low and miserable and scared as that person, I don't think we're in a position to judge. And for me, it takes big, big balls to do that. And anyone listening, I am not promoting suicide i'm just looking at it from both sides of the fence it's a lose-lose situation no one wants their loved ones to die but nobody wants to live in misery for the rest of their life and i think people live in misery for many many years before they before they take that leap it's not like they wake up one morning and think fuck this i'm out Mm -hmm. i think they fight it and fight it and they live with it and they try every single possible angle and they exhaust all avenues of Fulfillment, excitement, purpose, joy, happiness, love. And they just can't find it anymore. They can't feel it anymore. It's gone. It's never coming back. It's redundant. And they, they've, they know that. And they've identified with, the, with their new self. And they don't, they don't like it and they want to go. So what I would say is, and this is kind of my message all the time on social media, is no matter how hard life is at the moment, just picture, picture yourself now. You're, you're watching this podcast now. You've been made redundant or y- your wife's left you. Or you've just been made bankrupt. Your best friend's betrayed you. Heaven forbid one of your parents has died. It's not nice. It hurts. You feel like you're never coming back from it. You feel like your life is over. If their life is over, if my job's over, if my relationship's over... You kind of identify yourself with that and you feel like it's over for you, but it is not. You can rebuild, you can redesign, you can regroup, you can re-identify, you can reframe everything because the mind is so fucking powerful and it's so beautiful. And despite this topic of conversation leading to darkness, we have to remember the, the, the beauty in life and the things that you can do and achieve and the fulfillment you can find 
in the smallest little things, relationships and communication. So I always say, don't give up, even if you want to. Don't give up. See it through. Keep fighting. We've been fighting since the dawn of time. We are fighters. We're now fighters in disguise. We all walk around wearing clothes and reading books and putting our glasses on and waiting for the zebra crossing to bleep so we can cross the road. But years ago, we was all on the front, on the front line, fighting wars and battles and life has never been easy. So just try and put a few things into perspective and remember, and also remember that someone out there, a lot of people I feel, feel lonely for whatever reason something's missing and it may just take one thing to fulfill you again it may be as simple as fucking hell i didn't realize how much i love tennis as simple as that but you may feel lonely and empty and completely deflated and you can't take the easy way out because look at what we've got at our disposal now we've got communities of people places we can go gatherings Numbers you can call for help, social media where you can network with people, communicate, platforms you can go and share your feelings. Don't give up and don't feel like you're on your own because I'm telling you now, even the strongest of men have days where they feel like they're beat. But you can bounce back and the bounce back is beautiful. The comeback, the return, that's what puts you on the map. If you're feeling broken now, and I relate this to when my nan died. That was the most painful experience of my entire existence. And if it wasn't for my mum still being here, I would have seriously considered clocking out. I mean, it hurt me bad. 14 years down the line now, and I don't accept a day of it, and I'm not recovered by any stretch of the imagination, and I don't want to recover. But I stuck it out, and I built myself back up again. And I had a responsibility to look after my mum and make sure that she was okay, she was safe, she was secure. Grief is, is horrendous, but don't let it beat you because it's the circle of life. And you know how bad that feels when you've lost somebody. So don't try not to let someone lose you if you can help it and if you've, if you've got it in your, in your control. That was kind of a bit of an oxymoron thing to say because I'm hitting it from both sides but the, the moral of the story is don't give up on yourself and believe in yourself because there's somebody out there that loves you needs you wants you and would be fucking lost and devastated without you remember you're important I think a lot of people forget the importance of themselves because they're downtrodden and they're beaten and society whips them and everyone feels like a slave they got to get to work on time. They've got some, another man looking at them, looking at their watch if they're five minutes late. They don't feel worthy. You fucking are. Remember that. We're all just trying to get through. When was your darkest days? My darkest days of women and died. Without a, nothing compares to that. And nothing compares to the day to, to the day my nan died, and I purposely don't talk about it. When we, I mean, if we was off camera, I'll talk about it because if I needed to take five minutes and fucking cry my eyes out, I could. So I try not to go into too much depth on it, so that it doesn't ruin the flow, certainly of of people watching. But I mean, bereavement is it is a topic to touch base on because we all lose people, and I say this as well. People need to start building themselves up. They need to start becoming more stoic, more accountable. They need to have more vision and determination and discipline and grit and aggression. And they need to start preparing themselves for the worst. Because one day you're going to get a phone call that you didn't think was coming, that you never wanted to come, that you've been dreading your entire life. And it comes and when it comes, it will drop you to your knees and if you're in a weak, vulnerable state because you're abusing your central nervous system with drink and drugs and you're fragile anyway, you get a phone call saying that someone you love has just died of a heart attack. You are not equipped to deal with that. And that's possibly the end of the line for you. So that's another message I like to remind people that you can be flying high one day. You can be the king of the ring, the big dick. <laughs> and then it takes 
one phone call and you're that child again. You're that lost, helpless child again. So we need to be conscious daily to be building ourselves up, eating good food, reading good stuff, digesting good stuff, material content, associating with the right people. Bring back men building up other men. You look fucking great today. I love the way you've done that. You handled that really well. Men seem to like all this taking the piss out of each other's stuff. It's not good. Chips away at your subconscious. You know, you tell somebody they're worthless enough times, they'll fucking believe it. If David Beckham lived in my house, if he lived with me for six months, I'd come down day one, I'd say, fuck me, Dave, you're ugly. And he'd look at me and go, whatever. Day two, I'd say the same thing. The first week, he'd think, Liam's told me I'm ugly for seven days on the trot. Come week two, he's going to start thinking, has he got a point? He'll start looking at himself. You keep machine gunning with negative comments. Eventually, you're going to get through. And I've been on the receiving end of that, of that kind of narcissistic abuse, that grandiose narcissistic abuse, and it will take its toll. So you've got to be careful what words you use with others, and you've also got to be careful what words you use to others. If you care about someone, fucking let them know. Don't, don't feel inferior. Clap when somebody else wins. Cheer them on. Even if they just fly light speed ahead of you, even if they're so far ahead of you, you can no longer see their heels, fucking clap and say, bravo, well done, fair play. I respect and admire you. You've inspired me. Don't sit there getting all bitter and twisted about it. That's not good for your soul. Bring back men building up other men. But the darkest days was when my nan died. But back then, I, I mean, you're never prepared but I was, I was physically fit. I was doing the best I could to make sure that I was headstrong and was a rational thinker. But that was the, that was the, the, the darkest time for me. And that time, sadly, is going to come for everyone, whether, whether it's an expected death or an unexpected death. Those times are coming for everyone. And don't think you're exempt from fucking heartache and bereavement because sadly we all are and it it pains me to say that because I don't want to burst someone's bubble that's flying high at the moment but just if you're on your knees at the moment remember you can fucking stand tall again but also if you're flying high and you're you think you're the shit that don't stink I remember we all do and remember to be humble and remember to give other people respect and thought and consideration because I guarantee when you think you're numero uno and you're flying high and you're bulletproof and nothing can touch you and you're above it all and then you start looking down your nose at people and not helping people out and you no longer put your arm out for somebody that needs that arm to pull them out of that dark hole if you become that self-centered self-obsessed narcissistic shitbag you are going to be banging trouble when something monumentally bad happens to you. Because you know what? All those people that you trampled on, that you now need, they're not going to be there for you. Be humble. Yeah, I think it's important. You touched on a lot of good topics there. You also spoke at the start about addictions, things that you get lost in. Porn, a massive one. Listen, I watch porn. Pff, the Freeview Fantasy X back in the day. Nine, 10, 11 years old. Never to the extreme you went. Every, every man out there is a wanker let's be honest but you went full <laughs> porn like I would watch the 10 minute free view at night trying wait till your mum and dad's in bed you're sneaking down the stairs mm. only thing is I think when you watch something downstairs you had to make sure everyone was sleeping because if you're watching it downstairs all my te televisions in the house were all fucking connected because my dad had this weird box that you could get to see what he was watching so I had to wait, everybody was going to bed, listen to all the doors, make sure everybody, nobody's watching the TV, because the last thing they want to do is switch on the fucking telly, and they've got a big set of tits there, so <laughs> I always used to go down, and like I say, every kid always experimenting, kind of hormones everywhere, you ended up really bad on it, porn addiction, is that correct? Yeah, I did, and again, I've, I've backtracked, I've looked inwards and outwards, and sideways in fact, because... And we'll, we'll go from the start to when I decided no more. But, I mean, porn kills a lot of things. 
It will mm. kill your testosterone. It will kill your drive, your discipline, your motivation, and it will destroy your relationship. Because if you've not got sex, if you're not, if there's not love making within a relationship, it's not a loving relationship. It's game over. I bet a lot of people's problems are one of them is watching porn. You're sitting there jerking the gherkin to porn. <laughs> you don't need to make love to your missus because you, your gun's no longer loaded. It's empty. And also you then become stimulated by the fantasy of sex, by the vision of sex of others, which if we think about that and break it down, watching two strangers that you've never met, that you don't know, that you don't even know what they're said, how they smell or feel or what they've done or where they've been that day. You're watching these complete strangers having sex on the television. It's fucking weird. Let's be honest. It's fucking odd behavior. And I absolutely love the fact that I haven't watched porn for a long, 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 long time. And I know just how damaging it is. But I know why I got hooked on porn. I mean, by default, I'm an addict anyway. Everything I've ever done. Everything I've ever done, I've become addicted to. Everything to self-soothe. Drinking, taking drugs, exercising, watching porn, eating food, you name it. If it gives me a dopamine hit, I've been hooked on it. So now I know if I feel like any addiction from any of these things that want to draw you back, the second I feel that it's slipping into the driver's seat, bam, I put it back in its box. If I start having a drink again on a Sunday with a, with a bit of lamb, for example, and then that glass turns into a bottle or two bottles and then I'm on a bender. And then on the Wednesday, I think, well, I'll have another one. And then the following Friday, it's like, whoa, 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 slow down. Who's in control here? You or the substance? So I'll check myself real quick. And then I think, okay, I'm going to go 100 days without you. And then I'll just completely and utterly leave it. I'll purposely, and even if there's a special occasion, it could be a wedding, it could be a stag do. If I feel like I've, I've overdone something and I get invited to something after I've committed to a hundred days of being absent from it, because it's better for my state of mind and I know the damage it will cause, I just cancel all events. I just stay in my lane and focus on doing good stuff and pumping good shit out into the universe. But with the porn, and I bet there's far more porn addicts out there than they'd like to admit. In fact, there'll be porn addicts out there that don't even know they're porn addicts because they think watching two strangers or three strangers having sex whilst sitting there wanking themselves off is perfectly normal and acceptable. It's like, well, I bet it's, I bet it's draining your performance at work. I bet your business is suffering. You want to be walking around with a fucking loaded gun. <laughs> Don't you? You, 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 you want to be stimulated by a human being. What you need, what you need to find arousing is somebody that you love, just a little bit of eye contact or their hand touching your thigh, back of your neck, anything, or a word that triggers something romantic within you. you know, people need to be making love. People need to be connecting. And again, we go back to the whole disconnection and the, the, the defranchise of humanity at the moment, the country, the community. Porn is just going to distance yourself from human beings of the opposite sex. That's not good. It's almost like porn was, I mean, if I was a religious guy, I would think the devil created porn to create division, divorce, heartache, dysfunction. So I st I'm not religious, by the way, although I do respect people's religion if it gets them to sleep at night and they're not hurting anybody. So that's, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not anti-theist. I'm just atheist. And when somebody tells me, yeah, but I believe in God because of X, Y, and Z, I say to them, I believe that you believe that. And I'm glad you do because it's good for you. For me, until I meet the man, I don't believe in him. So the porn, I was exposed to it at a very young age, too young. So my dad would have his fucking mad drug fueled parties. And then in the morning when I would come downstairs, there'd always be porn playing, always be pornography playing. So back then it was, it was 80s porn. So there was big hair. Hairy fannies. Natural breasts, hairy fannies. <laughs> yeah. But, and also, I mean, this is, this is an interesting thing. 
And anyone that's watched enough porn will know that 70s and 80s porn is it, PG. It's very different to modern day porn. And back in the 70s and 80s, when you're watching porn, the plumber walks in, there's a bit of a storyline, there's a sparkle in their eyes. They both look like they're enjoying themselves and they're making love rather than rigorous, gratuitous fucking like you see in more recent porn, which which I'm glad to say does absolutely zero for me. And I, I've always reverted back to the genre that I watched when I was eight or nine or 10 years of age. It's always retro porn from, from, you know, from the, from the stint of time that I was watching it. It had to be, I had, there had to be, there had to be fur on the rug. <laughs> yeah. The breast needed to be natural. You know, they both needed to be good looking human beings. It needed to be one on one. I needed to believe that they was in love with each other. And I know this because I've analyzed it. And so I was desensitized to porn. Well, not desensitized. I was stimulated by porn from a very, very young age. A very young age. How old? Ten, you say? Nine? Maybe eight, nine, ten. Yeah, that's young. Cer certainly, certainly nine. I was extremely familiar with porn. By ten, I'm, fam I'm familiar with porn stars' names. Your dad used to leave it on in the morning? Used to leave it rolling. Was that on purpose or was he watching it well, they would night it, where the TV's been left on or was it just wanting that so, sound? So it, it'd have parties round his house. Sex when, parties? When he lived in Burgess Hill. It, it may have, it, well, I would imagine so. Now, so I would go to bed. He would obviously want me out of the way by this stage because he's got all his mates round, couples, and they're all, they used to play cards around the table they'd all be drinking they're obviously all taking drugs as well you could smell the weed fucking everywhere and then i would go to bed and then when i'd wake up there'd be people passed out on the sofa on the floor there'd still be people in the in the kitchen i, I obviously now know as an adult exactly what was going on and there'd be porn rolling so you walk down and you know you, you come downstairs for the first time as a, as a nine-year-old boy you know, and you, and, and, you, and you see an erect penis going into a, into a hairy vagina, that gets your attention. It gets your attention. It's like, well, what, what have we here? And then curiosity does eventually kill the cat because you then, you know, it, it arouses you. You get stimulated by it. I mean, it's the most natural thing in the world. You know, but that's why you and me are here because at one stage in our parents' lives, they were sexually stimulated. So it's perfectly natural, but it isn't natural for a nine or 10 year old boy to be getting an erection and wanking to porn. But that's basically how I slip streamed into porn because I was exposed to it as a, as a child. That's child abuse. Anyone that doesn't think that is needs a fucking checkup from the neck up. That is child abuse. As an adult, your job is to preserve the innocence of children. One of them is to make sure that if you're, if you've got things that shouldn't be seen, make sure they're out the fucking way. If they're for adult viewing only, it's strictly for adults. So then I just got kind of hooked on porn from there. And then I'd be any opportunity, because it was all VHS back then. You'd get a four hour tape and you could put it on long play. So then you'd get eight hours worth of pornography and you'd have to sit there and fast forward and you know, from a very young age, I was rewinding the bits that I liked, rewinding the bits that really, that really done it for me, you know, and playing with myself as a child. And I'd imagine that would be the same for anybody that was, that was new to porn. Imagine the first time you tasted chocolate. I bet you didn't think, yeah, I don't fancy that again. I bet you thought, cool, fuck me, that's, oh, I'll have some more of that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that is what it was like. So I just got more and more, like I say, anything I've ever got into that's given me a dopamine hit or a rush or pleasure, I would just take it to, to new levels. And yeah, I spent years and years and years wanking myself silly to pornography, thinking it was normal because I knew no different from a child. Whereas you get to a point where you think, this isn't good. This isn't good for my equilibrium. What was the most than a day? What, the most? Wanks. Double figures. <laughs> yeah, double figures. Yeah, that's extreme. Mm. Yeah, double figure wanking. How about that? <laughs> you'd, think, you'd think I'd have better forearms. <laughs> that's a lot, bro. 
Yes, a lot. And this is the thing, you You're know. Not shooting dust after. Oh yeah. Four or five. At, 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 at the end, a puff of smoke comes out. But before the puff of smoke, you get like this transparent globule appear. Were you still getting that release? You're still get. You're still getting a dopamine hit. But when you get to that state, that's, that was actually the moment where there was one day where it was just excessive. I've got it playing on a laptop, the TV. I've got it every, every, multiple CDs in the laptop. And I'm just sitting there in a room watching porn on multiple screens, jerking off like a fucking loser. And then I realized this isn't even enjoyable anymore. You're actually on your eighth wank. And when you came, it hurt. That's enough. This isn't, you're not enjoying it anymore. And it's a bit like a food addiction. When you sit there and you've eaten your roast dinner and you've eaten your apple crumble and then you tuck into the Pringles and then you start eating the fucking Terry's chocolate orange. And then you want ice cream. It's like, I feel sick, but I'm still going back for more. Why? Because it's an addiction. So I was acutely aware that I am a porn addict and it isn't fucking normal and I no longer enjoy it. And I made a phone call to my girlfriend at the time. So we are going back years. I was late 20s. I made a phone call to my girlfriend at the time. I told her what I'd spent the day doing. Did she know? No, no. What, how could then, when they come into your life and they want to fuck, could you, would you, could you have been asked doing it? Because you know yourself, the, your, your, the TV perception and real life perception, it shifts. Because watching porn, it shifts as people as objects. Mm. It darkens the brain, it kind of makes you sad. And we know all the kind of science behind it now, how if you watch porn, you are depressed. But could you still connect at a level? You'd make excuses not to have sex so you can watch the porn. Porn will, would win, and I bet if people are honest with themselves that watch a lot of porn, porn wins every time. Porn wins every time. You gotta, and it does darken your soul, and it dampens your brain, and it lowers your frequency, and it, it drains your energy. It's not, porn is not good. Porn isn't good, and I'm not gonna preach it, you know, like this is, it's like it's a religious cult, but if you're watching it, Give it a break and see how you feel. Take a hundred days off. That's what I done. I, I went online and researched what they call it, no fap, no freight, or, or something like that. There's a term which people do. So I looked into it and I think somebody had done 90 days. And then I saw a 99 days. I go, right, I'm going a hundred days. I'm going a hundred days. And when I say a hundred days, all I used my cock for was to go for a piss. So there weren't even wank into fantasy it's just i'm just not watching porn i'm not in i'm not engaging in anything of any sexual nature and that was it i never ever looked back and i realized retrospectively that porn is the work of the devil and it will snatch your soul and it will kill your relationships and let's be honest what's more important than relationships nothing without relationships we're just empty vessels floating around like a fart in a trance with nothing, no substance, no depth, no meaning, no purpose, no joy, no love, no lust. You lose your lust when you watch porn. Who wants to live a life without lust? You don't pine or crave for another human being because it's the screen that turns you on. It's the fantasy. It's the fake avatar of a sexual act that does it for you. And I dread to think what kind of porn people are watching now because it isn't the same as the porn that I used to watch when I was a kid. Like I say, there was pubic hair, there was natural breasts, there was good looking men and women, and it looked to me like they were enjoying it. Now I know that the porn industry is a very, very dark and seedy, wretched place. But back then you don't know, do you? When you're a kid, you're watching porn, you think, well, they, they look like they're having a fucking whale of a time. Yeah, it's degrading now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, yeah. and that's, again, so you think of everything we've touched base on, it's degrading now. Porn is now degrading. Why the fuck is that? Because it's got to be supply and demand. Why are men wanting to watch women being sexually degraded? It's fucking weird how the world has got. And I'm very glad I never fucking played my part in that shit. I'm very pleased of the genre 
that done it for me. <laughs> that's the that's the say that's the silver lining. I'm very very pleased that it was it was just two people that looked like they was having normal sex that that done it for me. Yeah, for people struggling, for do your own research. Semen retention is so important. You'll see boxers are anyone in the kind of fight game they'll kind of go without sex or masturbating for eight weeks ten weeks because the energy changes mm. you automatically feel good you automatically feel great so see when intention is important see when you went 100 days did you have any wet dreams or anything nope no a lot uh, of people do that they yeah. take some to a place and they wake up and they fucking came in their pants yeah I've never had a wet dream in my life I've never ever had one and I, and I thought that's good that's going to happen if I'm going to go 100 days retaining my semen how am I going to keep a lid on that but because I wasn't watching the porn and that was the thing that was stimulating me the most, if I'm not watching porn and nothing else was doing it for me, then the chances are I'm not going to have a wet dream. And it, it kills, it's the intimacy that it kills. I mean, that's the most important thing for men that are just sneaking off, having a, having a wank, thinking it's harmless. It's like, yeah, at the time it does feel like it. And, you know, everybody wanks. Everybody has a Sherman tank. Everyone, even you watching, <laughs> sitting there on your high horse thinking, it's like... <laughs> Looking them down at their nose. Yeah. There's a couple of wankers talking about yeah. wet dreams and porn. Everybody well, does it. It's the biggest, one of the biggest commodities, if not the biggest on the planet, especially with fucking prostitution, especially with porn. A lot of men are lonely. One third of men are virgins. So they're going to gravitate towards that because it makes you feel... As if you're doing it's like me with the eating, it's rewarding the brain. You feel, feel mm. good, feel good. A lot of people use that with porn to get that kick and feel good. And but it's disgusting, it's it's seedy. And I'm saying that now because I'm fucking 40, but I was bad with it all through my teens and 20s. You know what I'm saying? It takes you to a dark road, but then you start understanding it. You start speaking to people, even the porn stars and only fan girls interview. Like, no disrespect to them, but you can see there's something sort of amiss. Mm. behind their eyes they can portray it with they're making money and they're not doing any harm by all means listen be who you want to be do you know what I'm saying but you do see there's a disconnect there with them and um, and I feel as if with the way the girls are going now it's all competing one of the girls has just slept with 150 guys in a day and we're normalising like you say back in the day it was the guy with the moustache coming in to fix the fucking washing machine and it was crazy now it's People are having sex with multiple men, 150 in a day, and we're normalising that, and they're all, all trying to out-compete each other. Where where the fuck does it stop? We're becoming so lost in a society mm. and in a world where we're normalising madness instead of actually stripping it all back because it's easy to sell because men get horny easy. Mm. So it's easy to then sell that product because that's why OnlyFans are so popular. Men feel, want to feel part of something. Men treat these OnlyFans girls as their wife and think they've got a partner, but really they're just milking you for your money. Mm. It, even when you just said all that, which is so true, it saddened me. And when I went back to saying how I, when, the, the, the degrading side of porn, it goes back to me having a lot, a lot of love for women and a lot of respect for women because I was raised by women. So I never went down that route. I never, I never wanted to see two on one. I never wanted, you know, the porn I used to watch used to have background music. <laughs> used to have funky background music. I could sort of buy into that too. It's like, cause you know, I like my tunes, but when the background music stops and you're hearing, you know, the, the throttling of someone's tonsils from a great big fucking oversized cock, it's like no one's having fun there apart from the bloke with the big ego and the big dick. <laughs> but that just ain't for me. And like you say, Sleeping with 150 men in one day. Where, like, where, where does it stop? Where's the limit? Because the competitive nature of society and also people will do anything for attention now because they're, they've got daddy issues or mummy issues. It depends. You know, there's, yeah, I mean, you, you had a porn star on your show and I actually watched it because I'm keen to get a porn star on. I'm yet to get one on to discuss porn. And like, I'm an open book. Yes, I used to fucking thrash the old boy far too often. I watched too much porn. I was acutely aware it was an addiction. I dealt with it. It's the best thing I ever done. My energy resurfaced, my outlook, my connection, intimacy. You don't want to be turned on by a fucking screen of strangers you don't know having sex. You want to be like looking somebody in the eye and touching their skin and smelling them and making love to them. And... You had a, a guy porn star on, 
And he was the boyfriend where well, they both ended Sophie up. Sophie Anderson both so, them lost her life, man. So, God, right. Sophie was a good soul as well. I yeah. like Sophie. She was the porn actress that I wanted to come on the podcast the most because I kind of wanted to counsel her like you were doing when you interviewed her because no one behaves like that that doesn't need help, support and love. No one does that. And she conditioned her brain so much that she went to such extremes, like letting people shit on her and stuff like that. Actual human shit. That's so off the fucking Richter scale. So I wanted to talk to her about the porn industry and really just so the viewers could get an understanding of just how dark it is. It looks glamorous on screen because Pornhub want you to believe it's glamorous and they're all having a wonderful time. I don't believe they are. They can't be. It can't be nice. And the male porn star that was on, that was her boyfriend, he struck me as an extremely damaged human being. He was a football player, weren't he? Yeah, Crystal Palace, I think. Played for Crystal Palace. Obviously didn't think he was enough. Had enough about him to know that he was an attractive guy. I mean, anyone can work out if they're well hung or not. They just got to look down. And he obviously thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll turn to porn. For, for my fulfillment and adulation. And he went down that route and I could just see it in his eyes that there was something missing. Because not only was he partaking in porn himself, he's also got somebody that he's meant to love implicitly, also engaged in extreme pornographic activity. So as a man, I mean, you can't, you can't even imagine your partner having sex with another man if you love them, let alone sit there and fucking watch it and work together just the whole thing blew my mind so I, I am look i'm looking for a porn star to come on that can give a real honest account of what that industry is like so anybody watching this that's a porn star and it's it's an actress that i want i want a female porn star to come on because i feel like it's them that's getting exploited now i know that the only fans girls will exploit the men they've got a webcam in their bedroom they can pick and choose when they work Although that's not always the case, as we know. There's always fucking degenerates out there that will have their girls working for them. And But on a whole, women now have got the independence to set up their own OnlyFans account, set it up in their bedroom, and just sort of milk desperate needy guys' uh, incels, as you were. So that's... It's still distasteful. It's still not good for their soul, I'm sure. But I would like somebody to come on that has really, really gotten stuck into the porn industry that can give a cautionary tale to people watching it because if it gets into people's brains that they're watching what could essentially be a sex slave trade labour they may think twice about putting their cock in their hand before they watch that junk I think the way things are going I think people would enjoy that even more so because they say on Pornhub over 60 or 70% of it is abuse no. girls sleeping and Carol's being trafficked. It's not normal. They're trying to close Pornhub down. Pornhub have got videos of young girls on it because I'm going to get the girl who exposed it on and it was just, she was exposing it with all the videos of people who are trying to report it. Um, girls sleeping, girls drugged up, young girls, minors. It's fucking sick. It's a sick, sick industry. Mm -hmm. And because it's so popular and so much money to be made, they're going to keep fucking flooding it. That's why it's free. Mm. It's free because it damages. It's fucking demonic. It's Satan. It's fucking devil shit. It's like so bad. But again, people don't think they're doing anything wrong. Just like me back in the day, drinking drugs was fine. Gambling was fine. It was all mm. normalised. It felt good. So if you're feeling good from something, how can you then see it's wrong? Mm. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's hard for people to kind of separate. People just need to wake up, do your own research, look at semen retention, look at how bad porn is for the brain. If you're watching porn, you're depressed it's a fact that is a fact mm -hmm. and you you don't I, I doubt anybody with an erection sitting there beating it to its own drum at that moment in time realises they're depressed because they're on the verge of coming they're edging and that's what takes that away but that's exactly right if you are sitting there in a dark room watching pornography on a screen by yourself because people don't wank in public. Have you noticed that? 
Uh, the way things are, <laughs> what if you, the way things are going, mate. You speak for yourself, yeah. Tussie. <laughs> it's but, fucking turning upside down. It wouldn't surprise me if it was normalised in five years. Well, the way the world's people, going, yeah, yeah. For people just to whip out their pecker and start doing it. That's mm. how sick and worrying the world is becoming. Mm. Yeah, true enough. But people have got to realise that it's uh, it's not the way forward. Did you feel better? Oh, mate. Like a new man. Best decision I ever made. The best decision I ever made years, this is years and years ago, uh, was to stop watching porn. The best decision I ever made. I just felt, I felt free. I felt full. I felt virile. I felt like a man again. You tell me what's masculine about sitting there watching porn. What's masculine about sitting there watching you're not chopping down a fucking tree, are you? You're playing with yourself. <laughs> yeah, if people could see you, yeah, if yeah. people could actually look at the fucking, like you say, sitting in front of a screen with mm. your fucking cock in your hand, mm. masturbating the fucking two random people, like it is, it's psychotic behaviour, but because it's so normalised, normalised mm. from Hugh Hefner to the Playboy Mansion, back in the day it was frowned upon to look, when the girls are on Playboy or, or page three, mm. you think slags. Nowadays, that's fucking, that's easy. That's PG. That's mine. Nowadays, if you're not sucking 25 dicks, it's fucking not as extravagant as it's, because everybody's trying to level up. Mm. Everybody's trying to compete. It's orgies with 10 guys, 10 women. We get fucking trans men, trans women. You've got lady boys. You've got so much mad shit. It's it, it, the more you watch it, the more you're normalizing that behavior, the more you just become so disconnected to the world. I'm not an expert on it, but just look at the things for yourself the destruction of porn, look at semen retention, look at just things that then keep your vibration high, keep your, your message high in your own life. Well, you're, you're talking to somebody that has done all of that. Like I, I'm telling you now, semen retention is phenomenal for discipline and, and, and fulfillment, and you, you start to feel like a man again. And eradicating porn, that makes you feel like a man again. A, a, a man puts his hands around a woman he loves and he makes love to them. And then he feels like a man. Because then you can start working on your game. You can start working on, actually, I need to fulfill this person. You get more energy as well. Yeah, well, you, you get that sexual energy exchange. Yeah. If you're sitting there pulling your plonker, who are you fulfilling? Only yourself. It's a fucking selfish act. You're fulfilling yourself. You're not providing a service to anyone else. You're not giving anybody else any joy, any pleasure, any comfort. If you think about it that way, it's like fucking be a little bit more giving. Give to give to your partner. Make love to them correctly. Find out about their body, little little part. Like bring back romance. Get rid of all that fucking derogatory pornography. Get it off your fucking screen and bring back love, romance, and joy in the home that's my final message on porn because it can it can sound people can get a lot of this twisted what i'm trying to do is is just say get rid of the devil and bring god back and i'm not religious what i mean by that is get rid of the sinful shit that damages your soul and just get them core values back in check which is love romance intimacy and start caring for people and most importantly caring for yourself yes self-care yeah again you've been through a lot of stuff in your life which we touched on first podcast second podcast but you were stabbed mm. multiple times life or death kind of moment like what happened there can you touch much on that yeah well yeah i'll open right up about that there's well you'll realize when we that there's a certain part that i that i won't be able to go into graphic detail over because i didn't let it go mm. so me and two of my friends had been to a nightclub in another town. We then come back to our local town. So I got stabbed in my hometown in East Grinstead. I mean, it's a leafy little town in West Sussex. And this just didn't happen back then. I mean, now knife crime, we can go on about that because I'm, a, I'm an advocate for, you know, kids putting fucking knives down. Bad guys, put your fucking knives down. Good guys put you in a night, but we, that's, I can go on a tangent off that because I'm very, very, I'm very anti-weapons and knives and stuff like that. So yeah, You've lived it firsthand. I've you've lived, experienced the other side of it. I've been fucking... How old were you? 19. Very young. Yeah, 19, 1999. You were going to say something else? You've been what? Yeah, I've had it all. I've, I've had it all. 
I think 1999. I, I, again, dates. Yeah, so uh, you're talking uh, 20 uh, years 44. ago. It was about 20 years ago. Yeah. I've been stabbed, bottled, glassed in the fucking head. I've been hit, hit over the head with lumps of wood. I've, had, I've been jumped by men, kidnapped. I've lived it first hand. So I'm qualified to say, listen, you fucking idiot. Put that knife down. Is it worth the 10 years in jail? Is it worth killing someone or nearly killing someone? Is it worth someone's mum in a pool of tears, shivering in the corner of a room because you've murdered her kid because this fucking whole knife epidemic is somewhat trendy within these younger lads? It's fucking insane. And there's no mileage in it. There's no plus side. It's jail or retribution, and that will normally lead to them stabbing you. So be prepared. If you're going to go out thinking you're a fucking gangster stabbing people, don't think for one second you ain't going to get stabbed back because that's the norm now. So if you're going to try and kill somebody, be prepared that down the line somebody will try and kill you. Foolish on every level and very sad for the parents and also for them because I remember what I was like when I was a kid and life has changed so much because I took them steps to make a change that life is now wonderful and beautiful and there's, I can see all the greatness out there. If, you, if your life ends because you've either been convicted or murdered, you haven't got the opportunity just to feel what life's about. We're just passing. We're just visitors here. Treat life as a fucking theme park. Get on every ride and enjoy it. And the ones you like the most, have another go. Unless it's porn, because that's <laughs> not good for you. So anyway, you know I go off on a tangent, don't you? Yeah, it's beautiful. So Makes I've my uh, job easier, brother. I've uh, come to this kebab house. Me and two of my mates at the time, and it's funny because out of the whole thing, I felt sorry for my best friend more than I did me. And remind me to tell you my dad's reaction at the time as well. So it was around the time that he come back on the scene momentarily. So I'm in a kebab shop. There's four people outside the kebab shop. I've got my back to them because I'm at the counter. But I'm aware of aggro wherever it is. I know, I know if something, I knew, I would know if somebody was behind me just about to fucking hit me with a brick. I can sense shit like that. It's weird. It's always been the way. It's always been the case. And then people are going to wonder, well, how come you've been fucking stabbed and bottled and glass? How come you didn't see them coming? <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> but you know what I mean? 90% of the time, I'm fucking on the ball of my surroundings and energy. So I can hear this madness going on behind me. So I've got my kebab in one hand and a can of drink in the other. So I've now turned around to leave the kebab house in East Grinstead. And there's these four guys in a line but they're sticking it on anyone within their vicinity, anyone and everyone, putting it on them, starting on them, mugging them off. And they're, they've got their attention on one bloke in particular and they're all eyes on him, all fronting him up like this. And as I'm walking out, they've then seen me and then their attention's on me. I cannot remember what they said, but it would be words to the effect of, who the fuck are you? Do you fucking want it? Because that was normally the, the chat back in the day when people were trying to flex. So, and there was one person in particular that had all of the gob. So there's four of them. Two of them I can't even remember. One had all the mouth. One was the silent assassin that eventually stabbed me. So the gobby one is gobbing off at me. I've got a kebab in my hand and a can of drink in the other. And as I'm walking forward and he's fucking shouting and screaming and putting it on me, I've gone... Don't act like a fucking idiot, mate. And then he's gone for me. And by chance, I've managed to like lean back, miss his punch, drop the kebab and the drink, come out of the door and catch him with a real nice shot. Wallop. That was him done. No night. But I'm aware that there's four of them. So as I've come out, bam, put a good shot on him. He's hit the deck like a sack of shit, which was fucking good because if I'd have had two of them on me stabbing me, I wouldn't be sat here now. I've then spun round as quick as I could because I knew there's four of them. And again, this goes back to self-harm. I didn't care there was four of them. 
I just knew there was four of them. I thought I need to prepare for four people, knowing that I'm always going to lose, but I'll give it a fucking good go. Bam, it him, turn round, and it's the guy that wasn't saying a word, that was just staring at me the whole time. He's gone wallop, stabbed me right in the guts. Now, if you look, see that sticking, that bit that sticks out there? Mm -hmm. That's the first wound. And it took my breath away. And I thought, cool, because the other ones I couldn't feel. And there's a massive, see that scar under my arm there? Mm -hmm. That's a big one, isn't it? Mm. And he's working his way up. How he didn't get me in the heart, I don't know. That actually fits in real with your fucking tattoo. Yeah. It's almost like I asked for it. Yeah. Put that there, brother. <laughs> <laughs> so he's, it, he stabbed me for the first time. And I noticed it. Because a lot of people, when they say they, they get stabbed, they say they don't feel it because the adrenaline kicks in. But the first one, I did feel it. And I thought, God, fucking hell. I maybe thought, oh, my rib, ribs broke or something. So anyway, I start fighting with him. And then we're very, very close now. Very close combat. And my energy is draining pretty quick, which normally, if I'm in a situation like that, with me, fear kicks in. And then I just go, bam, like a fucking man possessed. And it's always put me in good stead. I've got a lot of energy when I need it in the reserve tank and you can get a long way with just brute force and anger and adrenaline but it sort of had a bit of an opposite effect i was getting drained quick so i'm trying to bite him because by now like i'm just not in a position to, to throw any shots and where his face is here it was perfect area to sink my teeth into but even then i'm sort of flagging what he's doing is he's stabbing the fucking life out of me eight official stab wounds and an attempted one in the back here, which would have gone through my brain, uh, potentially. But he's working his way up my body. So in the stomach, boom, 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 around the chest, near the heart, under my arm, then the back of the head. And then there's distance between us somehow. Again, I'm not, I'm not reciting something that happened a week ago. And then there's a crowd of people watching. And they've gone, Liam, run, he's got a knife. And then all I can see is just blood through my clothes. And I'm now feeling like this. Cool. I know that I'm not in, I know I'm not in good shape now. So I've ran, which is very unlike me. And I fucking ran with some pace. And I've climbed up a bank, I've climbed over a wall, and I've sat on a I've sat on a on a grass bank and I've pulled my top up. Now, if ever you've seen the film Chopper when he's, he's in the walk, he's in the walking area in the prison and he pulls his top up and you've got all his stab wounds and they're all pouring with blood. Identical. All of my wounds, it was like my stab wounds had a pulse. The blood is flowing out of me, pumping out of me. And I thought, I need to lay down. I don't need to sit down. I need to lay down. But I knew that if I lay down, I'm never going to wake up. I'm dead. I've been murdered. So the train station was not too far from where I was. So I got on my feet and I went to the train station. I remember saying, I need an ambulance and a Ribena. I still thought I was funny. And my poor mate by this stage, they've just made their way down the station. Because this, 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 this firm of fucking blokes got in the car and then carried on looking for me. So they weren't content with what they'd done. They wanted to carry it on. Anyway, ambulance come. Got my Ribena from the SO petrol station on the corner. People from the area will know exactly where I'm talking about. And my best friend's in the car and he's, he's crying his eyes out. But for me back then, I was also desensitized to, like I said, that level of violence. So I was just happy as, as soon as I, as, as long as I knew I weren't going to die, I was satisfied. I'm happy with that. No problem. Uh, and to this day, I've never had a problem with it, which is bizarre. Other things have, have affected me mentally like you wouldn't believe. That didn't. And we, we could say maybe I haven't identified with it, but it just didn't. He's, I'm getting dealt with in the ambulance. I've got CID coming to, uh, come to see me first thing in the morning when I'm, when I'm in the hospital. Fucking these horrible stitches I've got in me. My mate crying his eyes out. But as soon as I knew I weren't going to die, I was, I was at ease. So then after hospital, I then go home. And the bit I didn't like... The bit that saddened me the most was looking at my mum. And it's not like I asked for it. I've never gone out looking for ag. I've never been the guy that fucking starts it. I've never been a bully. 
but to see my mum see her son. And me and my mum have got a very, very special relationship and we always have. I'm very much a mummy's boy and we love each other very, very deeply, like any, like any mother and son. Uh, I'm not trying to say mine's any different, but I'm just trying to paint the picture that there's a very deep love nurturing between me and me and my mum. And so it killed me to see, I mean, how scared and devastated she was that her fucking son, because I'm always going to be her baby, no matter how fucking bald I get, which can't be much balder than this, or how hairy, hairy on my back gets, I'm always going to be her her baby so to see that sort of made me think but it didn't change me I still carried on with the with the violence with the fighting did that make it worse yes yeah I didn't take any chances after that in fact that's what ended me up very nearly going to jail where a guy told me he was going to put a knife in me and he had a very good reputation for doing just that and so I annihilated him there and then. There was no words. As soon as he said he's going to put a knife in me, there was a little bit of aggro in the club. If I'm honest, I didn't really want any aggro with him. I could think of much better people to fall out with. He's a fucking psychopath. And he said to me that he's going to put a knife in me. And back in the day, it was a help the aged shop. Funnily enough, my nan ended up working in years down the line. And... Yeah, as soon as those words left his lips, I went into him like no one's business. He went through the shop window. His sister was there. She still lives very, very close to me. It's a shame she had to witness that. But sadly, she had to witness that. And if anybody, even this afternoon, was to threaten me with a knife or suggest they were going to stab me, I would iron them out with extreme force that I wouldn't be taking no chances on that. I'd sooner go to jail for GBH than get stabbed and my mum have to hear that I've been murdered. Yeah, because the majority of people who do shout it never do it. Mm. Like you say, the kid who stabbed you never says a word. Mm -hmm. He was ironing up that moment, okay. Mm. Things are going a bit pear-shaped and done it in silence. Do you know what I'm saying? But because you've then went through that, you cannot take that chance whether someone's standing in silence or making the threats to do so. He says when you get stabbed eight times about what your dad done, what did your dad, what was your dad's response when you get stabbed yes, eight times? So my dad's response was to a young lad that had just been stabbed multiple times. It's an attempted murder. Someone tried to murder me. It's as, it's as simple as that. There wasn't any, any, in fact, he come into the hospital shouting and singing and dancing around and hollering. And it's the last thing you need when you're in fucking bits. But what his words were, who the fuck thinks they can do this to my son? Do they fucking not know who I am? That was his response to me getting stabbed. Not, are you okay? Did it shake you up? Let's get you back on your feet. What do you need? Anything I can bring you? Who the fuck thinks they can do this to my son? He took it as an insult to himself. It was as if I'd never, I'd ne never had been stabbed. It was all about him and how he felt disrespected by me getting stabbed and that's the kind of dog that i've dealt with my whole fucking life no em he's a psychopath no empathy no sympathy no cause for concern unless it affects him directly and that was the that was our, our outtake me and my mum actually still have conversations about do you remember the time fucking like when i got stabbed how my old man reacted it's like fucking just insane it was all about him it's like hello it's me that's been fucking stabbed here, not you. You wasn't even in the same town, but yet you think that you're the one that's been fucking insulted. So yeah, that was, that was his bizarre reaction, which just sort of people that watched part one will, get, will probably expect this reaction from him knowing that he's got a narcissistic personality disorder and probably a psychopath as well. But there were some serious charges with your dad. And I know you, as mad as it is, because we speak off camera, that you still loved him, mm. which is understandable. As a kid, all you want to feel is love from your mum, from your dad. That's where the addictions probably stem from, the porn as well. Mm. Some weird sort of 
someone seeing a loving, probably thinking in your mind it's a loving couple having sex when really we know how fucking degrading it is. But what you're going to do when your dad gets out, because it must be due out soon, even though he was charged with some serious crimes and uh, he sounds like a fucking nutcase, he'll probably try to fight his corner and blaming everybody else and everybody else is a liar. Like, is it a concern if he ever gets out? This is the scary thing. I'm, I'm not concerned in the least. And if I, I know, I know his mindset. I know, I don't like to give him credit because by me calling him a psychopath, he'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> so I don't like to get, I don't like to give him the credit because he'll like that. But the truth is, I know his mindset. I know how fucking evil he is. I know how nasty he is. And I know how violent he can be. And I know he's, he's behaved his whole life like he's got nothing to lose. And I would imagine that he will come looking for me with a gun, which I'm not phased in the slightest. And this isn't me flexing. It's just, I've had a great life for starters. I have had a great life and I'm a very happy-go-lucky geezer by default. But if my, if I fell asleep this evening and never woke up, I mean, I wouldn't know about it, but I, I wouldn't be bothered. I'd be like, I've had a great time. How old is your dad? 60, what am I, I'm 44, so he's 65. Surely not, he'll still not be fucking thinking that lifestyle coming up for 70. He's, he's nasty. And it, it, evil doesn't fade with age. Evil doesn't fade with age. You just mask it and hide it better because you know you need to be careful because you're now more vulnerable. But a man of his age, all it takes is that. Yeah, that's all he's surely, got to do. and obviously with the crimes that he was convicted of surely he's not brave enough to try and come out and speak about it because anybody who speaks to him is just as bad as him in my eyes as oh, well. he, he'll he'll still shout from the inner, from from the rooftops pleading his innocence that he was set up that it was a conspiracy that the that the cps were in on it uh that the detective was in on it that the jury were in on it that the judge was in on it he's matrix attack yeah, he'll come out saying it was the Matrix. It's like, no, you're not that important, Pia. You're a pleb. You're a failed criminal. You're a fucking sorrowful existence of a man. But that's because he's got that inflated ego. He can, he can justify his excuses for things. But yeah, uh, who knows what he's going to do. But And he'll know that this interview's taking place. And... He just better get the job done properly because I'll show him no mercy next time. I mean, when it was going on before, he steered clear from me. I committed I'm going to go all the way with this piece of shit. As soon as I knew what he'd done to other children, me I can deal with. Me, I've forgiven him. Me, I'm at I'm complete peace with what he's done. I've done what I had to do. I'm very proud of what I've done, putting my dad in jail. Very proud of that because I saved lives and I've always been a justice warrior and I've always wanted to protect the vulnerable and every thing in my life sort of comes back to that. The violence, the businesses, the social networking, the friendship ranking, everything comes back to, I feel like I'm strong enough to defend people less able. And he's a bully and he's an animal and he doesn't think like me or feel like me, and he certainly doesn't behave like me. But he better get the job done if he's going to come out and play silly buggers because I committed to going the full distance with this. Standing up in court is a big thing. I mean, fucking hell. Because it's me, I only really fully appreciate just how severe it is when someone else reminds me of that's really heavy you testified against your dad in a court of law your father who i loved and adored at one stage in my life that his voice gave me goosebumps but he done something so wretched that i was never going to forgive that or let that go i would never ever have been able to have slept at night because when you look at the innocence of a child and you look at where their life goes if you abuse that tiny mind. It's a slow death. Child abuse is a slow death. There's no child out there in the world that has a nice life forever that's been abused. If they've been abused bad enough, if they haven't got the resilience. So as soon as I knew what he'd done to other people, 
I committed. I'm all in. I don't care what I lose. I don't care if I lose fucking my friends, my partner, my businesses, my liberty. I'm coming for you and there will be justice. And there was. And he got a conviction. And for me, the, 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 out of the 18 years, I think only 18 months of his jail time was what he'd done to me. I think we covered this. The, the, uh, the lion's share of his conviction was for what he'd done to other people. And that was the problem I had more than me. I could have happily taken what he'd done to me to the grave. In fact, I don't know if you remember, it took somebody telling me that what he's done to me is abuse before I even real, before I realized it was abuse because it's the norm. Mm. It creeps in. Yeah. So yeah, it'll be, it'll be coming out all guns are blazing. I'd imagine I'll be very surprised unless he's picked up a severe illness in jail. Then I'd imagine he'll come out still thinking he's a celebrity, still thinking he's a gangster, still thinking his voice matters. I mean, I've heard stories when lads have seen him uh, coming down from his fucking cell to get transferred to court, telling people, people are shouting out, you fucking nonce case. And he's gone, shut your fucking mouth, you mug. You'll all know the truth when you read my book. It's like, no, 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 mate. Your truth isn't the truth. And A, you're not going to get a publishing deal because you're a fucking convicted sex case. And what are you going to call it? Memoirs of a nonce. <laughs> no one's interested in your book. You, your book was written in a court of law and they decided your version of events, your story was a lie, which is why you're now spending fucking some of the finest years of your lives languishing in a cell in Albany jail amongst other filthy pieces of shit. And what he's doing is because I've seen letters he's wrote people and they've just returned to sender and pretended that they haven't received it. And he's done this to multiple people. So it's not like he's going to hear this and think, oh, I know who that was. It's not like I'm putting anybody in trouble. He's done this to multiple people. I've got photocopies. To which he's playing God in Albany jail. He's deciding who's been fitted up and who's innocent. So I know that he's recruiting in there. He's building a little gang. Well, okay, I believe that you were set up and that you're not actually a nonce case, so you can be my friend, but you, you definitely are. So you're off the firm. You're an outcast. So in his mind, he thinks he's the fucking judge and jury in Albany jail because he's so off the Richter scale. So he's building a little network of people, building a little gang of fucking dogs. So he'll probably still think he's top banana when he comes out because he's, he's got delusions of grandeur. He's ill. Yeah, it's an old man and he'll get a recall if he starts saying every shit when he comes out. But yeah, it's a mad story. Your first one in fair play for, that's how I know. Like I know your loyalty, but I also know on the other hand, you wouldn't want to be fucking treading on your toes because like you say, you sent your dad to prison. Mm. That's fucking madness. And rightly so though, mm. when people actually listen to the story and who he was. Let's talk about the UK, how fucking mad it is and how upside down it is. And we speak about this stuff quite frequent. You know what happened to me a few weeks ago. Um, but yeah, it's in a it's in a weird state. And listen, I'm in Scotland. There's a lot of beauty in Scotland. You were in Scotland with me a few weeks ago. You see the peace, you see the tranquility, Loch Lomond, the beautifulness of it. But England... Ireland, uh, you see the madness that's happening, the stuff that Tommy Robinson, who's a really good friend of yours, we're actually in Spain just now with Tommy doing podcasts. But yeah, there's some mad stuff. What do you think the state of the UK is there now? I think the state of the UK is beyond repair. And under this Labour government, it's only going one way, and that's south. Until, until that maniac Starmer is no longer in number 10. We are in serious, serious trouble. He's lied to everybody in his manifesto. He acted disproportionately during the civil unrest. He's now bringing in blasphemy laws, sending people to jail for essentially asking who their God is. I won't say it word for word because I could end up in jail. And this is where... This is where the UK's at. Suppression, division, invasion, and it's all orchestrated. Do you know how easy it would be for the Navy to step in and stop the illegal invasion that's happening in the UK? 
It's what they're built and trained to do. It would be so simple to stop them or if they catching them and just return them to Calais. I mean, I think Donald Trump is now saying you get, if he, if he gets voted in, you get one opportunity to invade our country illegally with no paperwork, completely unfettered. God knows what you've done in the past. We'll put that down as a misdemeanor, send you back. Should you try and illegally gain entry to our country again, you're going to get a hefty prison sentence. There's a bit of a, so there could, there could potentially be a deterrent because normally what happens in the States, it spills into the UK. But in the UK at the moment, for me, I think it's just a completely, there's just unnecessary procedures put in place. And I think it's now good versus evil. I think, because I'm, I've always been center of the fence. I've always sat on the fence because I can see things that when we, we said this earlier on, I like to get both sides of the story. But I speak to enough people. I see enough things to know right from wrong and good from bad and which direction my moral compass is in. And, you know, the biggest bone of contention at the moment is illegal migration. And everybody that comes on my podcast without foul, they're not on there. They're not on there to talk about politics in the country, but they can't help it at the moment. Every single guest I've had on in the last, in the last hundred days since Labour come into government, every single one of them has got something to say about the state of the UK. And to see, to see our veterans, our heroes, our people that were sent as cannon fodder into other countries to fight wars, and who knows what the fuck for? None of us really know. And then they fight for their country sent to war by our country and then when they're chewed up and spat out they're left to fucking rot by our country and when I say by our country I'm talking about uh Judas government because that's what they are they're not putting their own people first which is fucking sinful and shameful and I don't like the country anymore and I've always been very patriotic and I will still keep standing up and fighting for it the best I can, but you can't expect, and we come on to the working class because it's the working class, I believe, that are being completely neglected and thrown under the bus. They're not being heard. They're not being listened to. How on earth can you be spending north of £8 million a day housing illegal migrants in hotels and military camps, and yet we've got veterans sleeping on the street on the side of the road, being rained on, sitting there in a howling fucking wind with nothing but a wet, soggy sleeping bag. And we've got illegal migrants coming into the country. And when people, these idiots on X, formerly known as Twitter, their only argument to anyone that's anti-migration is, well, you're clearly racist. Then it's like, no, we've got enough scumbags of our own. You see, if my dad was coming from fucking Afghanistan, creeping through different countries to get here. I wouldn't want him coming here either. I'd want that dog stopped at fucking Calais. Stop there, you're not coming into the UK. This is a civilized country, and if you wanna come in, there needs to be an exchange of value. I need to see your worth. I need to see your previous fucking work in history. I need an, en an enhanced DBS check on you to know that you are not a violent, criminal or a sexual predator or a national threat to our security. You're not a fucking terrorist. We don't know who these people are. How in God's name are we not allowed to talk about that? But they want to suppress our views and they want to put the fear of God into us so that we don't speak out about this so they can keep sweeping these atrocities under the carpet. The government, the deep state, they're all complicit in a very fucking sinister, a very sinister fucking long-term act. L Labour have just, what have they done? Invested 500 million in migration process centres for the next eight years. You said in your fucking manifesto that you're going to put a stop to illegal migration. Now you're going to spend the next eight years processing them. It's dark, it's sinister, and because there's so much divide, because there's so much distraction, they all want us to be distracted. 
so skint that you can't really get involved in any kind of mass movement because you can't afford to be there because you need to be at work to pay the bills, which you can just about cover for now. He looks like he could be raising capital gains to just south of 40%. What independents are going to want to invest in the UK? It's a dangerous place to live. I don't recognise it anymore. London has got a horrendous feel to it. And we can't keep allowing people that are unfettered into the country because if we don't know about you, we don't know what you're capable of doing or where you're going to go or what your intentions are. For all we know, these thousands of military age men that are crossing the border being greeted with a phone and accommodation because we don't know anything about them, they could all be networking amongst themselves. They could all be plotting here, there and everywhere around the country waiting to make their move. Yeah, it's fucking scary. And like I say, just for a concerned far, it doesn't matter what colour you are, what religion you follow. If you're coming over here without papers, without passport, without having the right kind of things to look into who you are, then by all means you shouldn't be here. Do you know what I'm saying? You're not racist or far right because you think that. That's everyone who thinks that. By all means, if you're coming from a war striking fucking place because of the damage America and the UK has done to other countries, if you're a refugee and bringing your family and your kids, by all means, come for a great life. I'm all for people want to have a better life. But when it comes to young kids, no passports, don't know their background checks, don't know their criminal record, and coming here, then there's got to be question marks of how do you make it possible where you've got to check these people instead of everybody just coming in for a fucking free for all but hopefully things do change and uh, right now man we've just got to keep strong kind of keep head above water I'll be surprised if it changes anytime soon because it would be so simple you stop the boats and you stop the benefits if there's no incentive for people without paperwork to come here they won't come here we're being, we're being hospitable to people we know nothing about and we're being despicable to the people that we should care about, that have cared about us. People that are paying into the system their entire lives, having their winter fuel allowance slashed. That person's worked their entire life paying their tax and you're slashing their winter allowance, their fuel allowance, but yet you're spending all this money housing illegal migrants. How does that make sense? How is it fair? How are we supposed to love a country that doesn't love us? And the two-tier policing that's going on is off the chart. It's, an, it's another bone of contention for a lot of people that are now awake in, in the UK. Look what happened at Manchester Airport. Manchester Airport, armed police officers in the airport, which is a very tense place anyway with previous events that have taken place. Police officers got attacked, smashed to pieces. And if you've only seen the ending of the video where the police officer kicks the guy in the face on the floor, you need to do a bit more research and watch what happened before that. A woman police officer got her nose broken. Not one arrest because they have a different culture to ours, because they're considered a minority. The police, the police haven't learned from Rotherham and Telford where children were systematically raped and abused. They haven't learned that Keeping quiet doesn't help. It just makes the problem worse. It amplifies it. And it leads to more devastation and childhood trauma and ongoing mental health issues, which then makes them reliant on the state because they're so cooked they can't get a job. They need their benefits. And then the government can go, there's just there's enough for you to get by. But do come back and do behave. And we will be keeping an eye on you. And it won't be long until you're chipped and we'll know your every movement. And then there'll be restrictions put in place. If you start connecting the dots, you can be called a conspiracy theorist or you can just think this is a purposeful, orchestrated thing that's taking place and only the people way above government really know what's going on, I believe. And I think there's a lot of police officers out there that will be handing in their notice now. There'll be a lot of potential soldiers that would be great for the country that won't be applying to fight for the country anymore. Our military is going to weaken and soften and dampen. TikToker weakening the minds of our children by pumping them full of crap, yet they're putting their own people, because you know, it's a China-based uh, app, 
They're pumping their kids full of information, intellectual property, stuff that's going to really amplify their minds and ignite their brain. We're getting silly dance videos and fucking, you know, clowns doing handstands and just silly pranks. There's a big, big, there's something going on here and it ain't great. And for, the, for them people in Manchester to still not be arrested for beating up police officers on camera, breaking a female police officer's nose, and then they're sending people to jail very quick for Facebook posts and retweets. So that's just not freedom of speech gone. That's now freedom of thought. Because some of those people that were jailed, they weren't inciting anything. They were just expressing how they felt. I mean, I'm not going to quote it word for word, but people have been jailed for tweets for saying words to the effect of, I don't care anymore if my tent gets blown away in the wind. I'm sick to death of that tent. I'd no longer care. They're obviously using different examples, but that's not me inciting you to get a fucking windblower and get rid of my tent. I'm just saying I don't care if my tent blows away. And so where people are airing their views and opinions and the police are storming in and arresting them, fast-tracking them to court, why are they all pleading guilty? They're obviously being forced and certainly heavily encouraged to do so. The fear of God put in them. If you don't, your sentence will be tripled perhaps. And then they're in court on the Monday and then they're straight to jail for writing something on a social media platform. We are still living in the hangover of the civil unrest, the riots. They weren't race riots for starters. They was coined race riots and then Farage riots. They, they were none of them. They were concerned parents riots. They were invisible people riots. They were people that have been dismissed and ignored for years. They were the people that took to the streets that were furious because there was a pressure cooker. And you cut off a man's tongue, it's going gonna, it's gonna to result in violence every single time. If you can't express yourself with words, the only other way is through physicality. But those riots, you cannot let the government put the fear of God in you so you no longer speak out about your fears and concerns and worries. You, can no, you can't let them not let you stand in the street and protest peacefully, but it is moronic and you need to really, really check yourself. You cannot be inciting violence. You simply can't. There's other ways of dealing with it and you're going to play right into, into the government's hands. You cannot be throwing bricks at police officers. Come on, you're better than that and it's mindless and it's only going to end one way. You prove them right, you go to jail, your family suffer. We now know that Keir Starmer shows no mercy. If he can pin something on you because he thinks you're the right-hand side of politics, he will do so. So anybody that wants to make a change, because it's all about making a change. We all want peace and harmony. I'm sure when the country is completely settled, migration legal migration will be welcomed again. We like different cultures. We like different people. We like different foods. We like different ideas, different perspective. But we need to know that we're getting these ideas and perspective and foods from people that we know that we can trust and rely on because they've been vetted and they've proved that they're worthy of living amongst us. We need to know that they're civilized human beings. But until that day happens, a change needs to happen. But we're never going to make a change by behaving like knuckle-dragging idiots. We need to galvanize the masses in their numbers and be peaceful and articulate and calm in what we stand for. Because at the moment, it's the working class that are being avoided by the left and figures on the right. No one's taken them into consideration. So they're going to be frustrated. So that would be that would that would sort of be my final message to anybody that wants to make that wants to make a change that's scared for their children's and grandchildren's future and the preservation of the country and our culture. I mean, patience is no longer a virtue. You can't just sit back and think, okay, it, it'll it'll all work itself out because it won't work itself out unless there's, there, there's a plan bigger than us. But still don't be afraid to speak out about it. But just don't don't speak out it. 
don't speak out about it with any kind of incitement. Just raise your concerns, articulate yourself, try and make sense of what it is you're trying to say and then say and then stand tall and then gather in your numbers and say, we are not happy. How are you feeling today, brother? I'm fucking ready. <laughs> Part two, done and dusted. Before we finish up though, what's your YouTube? What's your Instagram? What's your Twitter? For people to get involved, people to come over and have a chat with you. Yeah, come over and have a chat with me. My YouTube is at Liam Tufts and the podcast is called The Dozen with Liam Tufts. You can catch me on Instagram, Liam Tufts. I flick in and out of X. It's a very toxic platform. That's at Liam Tufts one and then facebook again i think is liam tuss but youtube's really the main platform where like james i allow people to come on with difference of opinion difference of culture difference of perspective to come on without any judgment i just want to learn from that person and and yeah this has been a bit ranty and a a bit all over the shop but the best is yet to come, certainly as far as, as my platform and where I want to go. And again, my purpose is to use the platform to build as many people up as I can and learn as much as I can so that I've got a good balanced view and perspective on the world and things. For anybody watching, just before we finish up, for anybody watching that's maybe in a life of struggle, I know you've overcome your own battles, but for anybody in that dark place, what advice would you have for them? My advice would be, and by this time next year, I will probably have a book published on the subject matter, and I will probably call it Don't Give Up. Now, that seems like a very thoughtless, easy title, but the power of not giving up is incredible. If you tell yourself, I'm not going to give up and be determined and be willing and to look inwards and to make sacrifices and to put things to the side that are detrimental to your health, because every single one of you know that self-soothing with a bottle of whiskey isn't going to ease the pain of that bereavement or that separation or that redundancy. You know it's going to amplify it, and then you're just postponing the journey of recovery. So do not give up. Start believing in yourself. A lot of people turn to God. A lot of people believe in other things. I find a lot of people believe in other things and other stuff. Maybe it's a distraction from them looking inwards. But what people have got to start doing is, is looking internally, finding themselves again, and that may be going out, camping in the woods for a week by yourself, joining the athletics team, whatever it may be, but do not give up. There's light at the end of the tunnel. I promise you, things will always get better once you flick the switch, but you've got to flick the switch. So first steps, if you're watching this as we're rounding it up, and you're going through a torrid, wretched time of heartache and misery, and you don't know which way to turn, first and foremost, you turn to yourself and you look in the mirror and you think, is there anything I can change? And have that honest, uncomfortable, disgusting conversation with yourself. I've had to do it. There were things I didn't like about me, which I will publish later on down the line. And to make a change, you've got to take the first leap, which will then lead to a quantum leap. So really, it's not give up and start believing in yourself because everybody has magic in them. Brother, love you. Love you, man. Have the best fucking life. I always bet your side if you <laughs> need me. Is, uh, yeah, wish you all the best for the future, brother. And you know I'm always here if you need me, bro. Likewise, brother. Good luck with it all. Cheers, Geezer.